This episode is sponsored by State Farm. Choices are great. Like with your podcasts, you get to choose what you want to listen to. And State Farm believes insurance should work the same way. That's why the State Farm Personal Price Plan helps you get the coverage you want at an affordable price and a policy that helps cover what you value most. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com today to create your State Farm Personal Price Plan. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. Scott for Scott's here. Do you hear that? Bring the mic in close. That's not how the grass should sound. There's weeds everywhere in this lawn. It's time to take action with Scott's Turf Builder Triple Action. It gets three jobs done at once, kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and feeds your lawn so it keeps growing strong. Ah, oh, much better. Get a bag of Scott's Triple Action today. It's guaranteed or your money back. Feed your lawn. Feed it. Welcome to the family here on Purple Mafia. I am your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Purple Mafia is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Google Play Music, Stitcher, and Double Twist. Thank you always, and I mean always, for downloading and listening to the show. Can't thank you enough. Uh, Well, we came into this week thinking, yeah, okay, there was a wonderful thing that happened way back in 1987, and then ironically, everything is setting up exactly like 1987, and... It's like this team is better than their record, just like they were in 1987. I mean, the Vikings, well, you know, you just threw away the last game. So we probably would have been 11-5 and in any other season or in any other situation. Just a play or two here and there, we could have been 12-4 and very easily. Just name the game that we lost this year, basically. Not all of them, but you get the idea. Uh, Well, Seattle, you know, I mean, Seattle, come on. Green Bay, one of the two for crying out loud. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) it is what it is. But, um... Then the Vikings go in and blow New Orleans out, and then head to San Francisco and beat Joe Montana. So, in this case, we're not exactly going against Joe Montana if we play San Francisco, but hey, it's interesting. We're going against the Hall of Fame quarterback who's won a Super Bowl with New Orleans versus, yeah, you know, the, uh, (laughs) versus the Raging Cajun, basically, is what he was. Uh, The Cajun Cannon is what he was years ago, Mr. Ebert. For the uh, New Orleans Saints, we blow them out. Not quite what happened, but uh, at the same time, you come back and, uh, well, I guess things are shaping up like 1987 after all because the Vikings defense showed up to play, this and that. Vikings offense showed up to play when it mattered. Thankfully, there were some scary moments, but at the end of the day, Minnesota escapes New Orleans. 26-20 in an overtime thriller. Twenty-six to twenty, a walk-off on the Saints again. Well, basically, yeah, it is a walk-off because it's overtime. Overtime is always going to be a walk-off unless it's a field call, that type of thing. But uh, pretty damn cool, pretty damn impressive. A million angles to come with this one, but the fact that you could see this team came out to play right out of the gate, if you had some faith, maybe, 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 but it's just probably like ah, it's just you know, it is what it is. The the, the other shoe is going to drop. The Saints are going to take over. Oh, and they did in certain places. Oh, Taysom Hill. My God, that guy was a pain in the ass to deal with the entire game. Um, Taysom Hill. I mean, I don't know. You keep seeing him out there all the time. All the time. All the highlights. Every time you play the... Every time the New Orleans Saints are on TV, whether it's Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback, Drew Brees at quarterback during the course of the season, you always saw this number seven out there who's a quarterback. But it's like, what's going on? Well, we really got a re- uh, reality check of how good he is. And it was quite frustrating, but he can do a little bit of everything. Basically, he can receive, he can catch, he can throw. He can do a little bit of everything. I don't know if he can kick field goals. That might be the next thing he might do. But, well, I mean, you come into the game, you sit down and analyze the Vikings' defense, and you think, if they actually show up to play, and if Mike Zimmer has the right schemes, Drew Bledsoe has struggled in the postseason the last couple of years. Drew Bledsoe has struggled against, uh, you know, struggled this season in the three losses. Now, of course, the San Francisco game between the Saints, that was kind of a barn burner back and forth, so neither defense had a great game at the end of the day. It was just spectacular offense between those two. But you saw New Orleans struggle here and there during the course of the season this year, during the course of the season last year. They got flustered against the Los Angeles Rams. 
And then, of course, even though they should have probably won that game, he got the massive uh, pass interference that was never called. And then now the, some of them might complain that there was a pass interference, offensive pass interference on Kyle Rudolph in the game final play that that wasn't called. But to, to me and to most people, it was just kind of a regular football play. It, if you call that, you got to call just about everything else. So, I mean, there'd be flags on the field on every other play, basically. One of those where you could call holding on basically every play as well in the NFL. And if you do that, it's not a fun game to watch anymore. With that said, the Vikings did show up to play today. Kirk Cousins was flustered at times, but generally speaking, he showed up in the big moments, and that's what had us all feeling spectacular at the end of the day today. I'm still kind of at a loss even what to say. I mean, a 26-20, we actually beat the New Orleans Saints in New Orleans. Um, History was on the Vikings' side, but recent history on the Vikings' side, no. Recent history is not on the Vikings' side. Um, Super-duper recent history, sure. Yeah, you got the Minneapolis Miracle, but it's like, is this Vikings team with this quarterback, this offensive line, this deteriorating defense going to go in and beat the New Orleans Saints, a 13-3 and team, just getting ready to go to the second round of the playoffs? I mean, they're just getting started, this New Orleans team. A team that I picked to win the NFC at the start of the season. I actually had Chiefs versus New Orleans Saints with the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl way back in uh, super early September, late August. I came to that conclusion, Chiefs versus Saints in the Super Bowl. Well, the Saints aren't going to the Super Bowl. And, well, I mean, Minnesota ended up proving everybody wrong. You get Kirk Cousins. It wasn't a primetime game, but it was a road game. And this time, there is no doubt this is a good football team. This is a winning football team that Kirk Cousins was able to defeat on the road. This is a playoff game that Kirk Cousins was able to win. Uh, His first ever playoff win. And he was a big part of the win. He didn't just luck into it. He wasn't Trent Dilfer with the 2000 Baltimore Ravens or anything. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, once in a while, once in a while, crazy things happen, and you might just be able to go on a playoff run. This team plays anything like this next week, uh, you just might get to the NFC title game. And, well, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, this Vikings defense has greatly improved the past few weeks. There's no doubt about it. Uh, Xavier Rhodes has greatly improved. He had a big, giant gaffe during the case, uh, during the course of today's game. He got another spat on the sidelines with... Uh, <laughs> Xavier Rhodes, ex Xavier Rhodes, I guess that's how he likes to say it. Ex Xavier Rhodes. Some people would like to X him right out of the lineup, but I guess you can't right now because, of course, you didn't have McKenzie Alexander and Mike Hughes is out for the season. He's on injured reserve, so that's very devastating. Uh, but then uh, Alexander has the sore knee situation. Hopefully he'll be okay to go to for San Francisco, but he'll be healthy enough to be effective and won't actually get us killed. But no, Xavier Rhodes had been playing a little bit better significantly better, but then again, he got destroyed by Harris on the deep play down the stretch. Extremely frustrating. And it was Taysom Hill, who threw a 50-yard 50 50 yard bullet to Harris, number 11. And Harris also had some good, pretty good returns as well. Extremely frustrating day. And that's uh, Deontay Harris, by the way. Only made one catch, only was targeted once, but was huge with that big play. And of course, his special teams ability. Uh, you know, the, one of those, you know, those special team speedsters but you felt damn good later on. It's just that play kind of took the wind out of our sails, that's for sure. Had us feeling like crap much later in the game. And you thought maybe the Vikings would be in big trouble. But luckily the Vikings would hang on uh, at the end of the day. I mean, it was such a low-scoring start to the game. You thought, oh, great. You know, the offense is moving a little bit, but then not really. Then the Saints are able to move a bit and capitalize on a crucial turnover, a fumble by Adam Thielen pretty early, had me cursing and swearing, basically like, ah, Adam Thielen, great, screw you, Adam Thielen, you know, you're out all those weeks, and then, you know, you haven't been, you you dropped a key pass against Green Bay that should have been caught, should have been caught uh, on, what what was it, the 23rd of December, uh, Monday night frustration there, should have been caught for a a big play that might have put the Vikings in position to take a lead against Green Bay and build on the lead against a Green Bay team that had been flustered. Uh, Aaron Rodgers was shut down pretty good in that game until later on. Um, but then you saw one frustrating moment after another there. Uh, you see Adam Thielen fumble. You see him drop this and that. Uh, luckily, it's a bend but don't break situation. The Vikings defense held, held New Orleans miraculously there. Kept them to a 43-yard field goal, or excuse me, 29-yard field goal down the stretch. Saved the Vikings bacon there. And then the Vikings end up tying it up. You know, they fail to get in the end zone. Big frustration there. 
offensive line is like it's good at times, but there were times today the offensive line has just super frustrated throughout the game, the run blocking, the pass blocking. Kirk Cousins was constantly under pressure in the game, but he held on just enough. He didn't make that stupid, crucial mistake that had us killed. This game is a game of inches. Sometimes it's a game of millimeters. I mean, just one millimeter this way or that way might have been a strip sack, might have been this, might have been that. You could have, you thought you could get Drew Brees in this play, and then you eventually did, and this and that, but you forced some pretty spectacular, <laughs> you, you, you just make some big plays when it matters, and that's when, at the end of the day, that's really where it all adds up. Uh, an unbelievable, unbelievable night, unbelievable afternoon for the Minnesota Vikings on the road. Uh, what got frustrating is the predictability of this offense. You got Delvin Cook in the end zone twice. He had some big moments in like the early to middle points of the game. But then the predictability kind of took over. It was like pitch to the left, pitch to the left, pitch to the left, pitch to the left. And it was literally like, again, it was the old Tecmo Bowl deal. It's like Tecmo Bowl football. If you keep running the ball, you keep running the same play, you're going to get like eight men in a box. And it's going to feel like, again, like eight on two, basically. You're going to have guys just flying right towards the running back, and what are you going to do? It's over. He's going to get tackled for loss every single bleep in time, and that's pretty much what it felt like. I mean, we're lucky Delvin Cook didn't fumble the ball away. And again, another moment there where it was a game of inches, a game of millimeters. Delvin Cook was somehow laying a different direction. That might have ended up being a fumble. Unbelievable situation there. And again, the possible push-off. Some people would say in Green uh, in uh, New Orleans, and I don't agree. I don't think most people do. I mean, it looked a little bit like Kyle Rudolph pushed off, but it was just kind of, as they call it, hand play. It wasn't really a major situation there that cost the Vikings. Um, mm. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, I mean, I don't even know where to go with this one at the end of the day. Other than it, you just come out feeling so good. Uh, Kirk Cousins' accuracy was generally where it needed to be. Uh, most of his incomplete passes were because they were throwaways. There's a whole not a whole lot you could do at the end of the day. Uh, Drew Brees' one touchdown pass in the game was to that Taysom Hill. I mean, it was time and time again that, uh, no, that one actually didn't. Ended up going to Kelvin, uh, Alvin Kamara. That play got called back. <laughs> Funny situation there. That's what throws you off because there were so many penalties at key plays that ended up changing everything. Penalties that would change everything, take things away, take this away, take that away. You felt confident coming in with Delvin Cook and Alexander Madison rather than Mike Boone and whoever, (laughs) Amir Abdullah out there. You feel a lot more comfortable with what you had at the end of the day with your full running back crew and hopefully your offensive line can hold up. Because basically what I was saying in the last week is you just want to get that same feeling you had going into Dallas on Sunday night a few weeks back, or like a month ago or so, where there was just an energy and a swagger to this Minnesota Vikings offense and defense. And then when you saw it, it's like, hmm, will it be enough, though? Will it be enough? Is this 13-3 and New Orleans Saints team, which should probably have a first-round buy, because most 13-3 and teams have first-round buys. Oftentimes, they're, well, minimum number two seed, but I mean, very often, it's a number one seed. We all know about being a number two seed around here, though, unfortunately. 13-3 and three record, and you can't get number one. So frustrating. But um, it just kind of is what it is. It just kind of is what it is. Uh, but you had the energy. You felt confident. But you just knew the momentum was going to switch back over. You just knew it. Vikings take a 10-point lead. You feel so good. You keep stopping Drew Brees. And you see, and he kind of has this look on his face like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what's happening out here. And that's what had you feeling so good. When you had uh, Daniel Hunter getting to him, and of course, uh, Everson Griffin had such a big game today. I mean, he was absolutely spectacular. You got to see the return of Marcus Sherrills, who generally did his fair catches, but good for him. And Marcus Sherrills gets to advance in the playoffs with his old team once again. That feels great. But again, no, I mean, you saw the pressure on Drew Brees and the frustration, some disguised packages. Uh, Daniel Hunter, a sack and a half. Everson Griffin, a sack and a half. Those two guys were basically just sharing the load there for that pass rush. It was absolutely great. You saw Trey Waynes out there in occasion where it just felt like, it's just like prevent defense of that guy. That's what drives me nuts about him. Uh, thank God you had Eric Hendricks back out there again who made some plays. Anthony Harris, another interception. I mean, how can you not love Anthony Harris? A key play there that really helped the Vikings in a situation that could have killed us 
we were we were in trouble. I mean, New Orleans was starting to gain some momentum, but you could definitely argue the play of the game was Daniel Hunter when the Saints were roaring down the field and it was a tie game. I mean, a scary, scary moment. You end up <laughs> getting Daniel Hunter with a strip sack on uh, Drew Brees, forcing the strip sack, literally just the strength of that tricep, pushing the ball out uh, in a moment that could have had the Vikings killed. Luckily, <laughs> the Vikings escape sudden, literally certain death there in that situation. I mean, it's the big plays by Daniel Hunter in the big moments that he's done in the past. Maybe that big sack that pushes a team back and pushes them out of field goal range. But in this case, again, a strip sack that ends up saving the Vikings' bacon. Just a huge moment. Just an absolutely huge, huge moment that completely, well, we won't say it completely changed the momentum, but it slowed the momentum of the New Orleans Saints. Because there were plays out there where, again, Taysom Hill was just running right through our defensive our defensive backs, our linebackers, could not bring them down. You had multiple linebackers on the other cook, the tight end cook of, uh, of New Orleans. Three Minnesota Vikings defenders trying to bring him down, Jared Cook, of course, and it just wasn't happening. He just kept going for first down after first down. There's just nothing you could do, uh, and the frustration just started to take over. You thought the, the Saints are going to win this easily, along with, again, the frustration of special teams play. Right after you do something, you take a small lead, and then you just give up a nice, huge return to Harris, again, the other Harris of uh, New Orleans. You get all these mixed-up names, which is funny. But, yeah, I mean... Harris had a hell of a game for New Orleans. He kept things rolling. You had a play that looked like a sure catch for Alexander Hollins. It would have been his first uh, postseason catch. That would have been a big play, but of course he gets the ball knocked away, and the Vikings end up having to give it up there as well. Moment after moment, uh, Tyler Conklin, a play that would have been big, ends up injuring his ankle in the end zone. We'll see what happens. He'll come back. It didn't look that serious, but he wasn't thrown to again in the game. Stefan Diggs getting pissed off and frustrated on the sidelines that plays weren't uh, sent his way. But then there were a couple of cr- crazy cute reverse plays. One of them where he ended up being the quarterback. They ended up amounting to absolutely nothing. Never got rid of the ball. Never got a chance to. A couple of reverse plays here and there. I mean, the defense, the defensive backs of New Orleans were gearing on Stefan Diggs pretty well. And Adam Thielen, thank God, after, a, after that fumble really early, made up for it big time with multiple big plays. One up with 129 yards and no play bigger than in the, in the overtime period. Again, the Vikings scared to death in a situation that looked like we're going to end up losing the game. New Orleans is going to march down the field, at least take a field goal, and maybe put us into, uh, well, push us into oblivion 23-20. New Orleans ends up winning before overtime can even happen. Luckily, Vikings end up getting the stop. You take the knee because, well, it is what it is. <sighs> it is what it is. You might as well take our chances. You get a situation going into the overtime period. You figure... New Orleans has all the momentum in the world. Watch, watch. They're going to win the toss, especially because we always call heads, and it's always tails. It's just always tails. But then, miraculously, it's heads this time. And it's like, okay, well, there's only one way. There is only one way the Minnesota Vikings win this game, and that's to score a touchdown on this drive and this drive only. Because New Orleans is going to find a way to score, one way or another. I mean, they'll get in field goal range and win the game. That's what's going to happen, and we're going to be frustrated. We're going to be pissed off. And at the end of the day, boy, uh, luckily, (laughs) luckily the Vikings end up winning the toss. But then you do the predictable plays here and there. You complete a couple of, uh, Kirk Cousins just seemed calmer than he had been because you're not fighting the clock this time. You're not worried about running the clock down because you're ahead by a short amount. So we got to forcefully run the ball one way or another. Even though, again, there were a couple of those pitches to the left again, (laughs) on the goal line, but uh, we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, you had the you had a couple of completions. I mean, you had more freedom to throw the ball. There wasn't really a fear that he was going to make a huge mistake. It's just a matter of, don't be afraid. Just go out there and freaking do it. I mean, the only way to do it is to freaking do it. And you got to go out there Tom Brady style Atlanta Falcons Super Bowl 50 and just score on the first drive. Never let Drew Brees see the ball. Never let Drew Brees see the ball, even though he'd been struggled, I mean, even though he'd been flustered a bit time and time and time and time again in the game. But it's like, you know, Sean Payton with his overly creative offense is going to find a way to get the Saints at least in a field goal range, and I don't think Will Lutz admits. He certainly nailed that 49-yarder that tied the game up. So, 
I don't think he's going to miss again, even though he did miss early on, 43 yards out. Pretty nice little hook there to the left. But, uh, well, you get lucky there sometimes, thank God. <laughs> that was a big moment, ready to go in into halftime, which had the Vikings hanging on to a three-point lead heading into the half. But uh, Kirk Cousins, after a couple plays, a couple of short completions and then a very short run, ends up gunning it deep to uh, Adam Thielen. Another play-action situation where he has succeeded so many times in the past. Uh, that's really the best play there is, other than uh, bootlegs here and there at the end of the day. Bootlegs and some, some nice uh, design screen passes that can hopefully foil the offense a little bit, be it a bubble screen or whatever it is. And, of course, the fades into the back of the end zone, which are some of the best ever. <laughs> you see the ball in the air heading to Adam Thielen, and he brings it in. He brings it in, and we're at the two-yard line. First and goal at the two-yard line. And it's like, oh my god, we are going to beat the Saints. The problem is, closed confines, Kirk Cousins tends to struggle. And we know how this Saints linebacking core, or front seven, we'll call them, have done against Dalvin Cook for the last, you know, <laughs> the last 30 minutes or so of play. You know, like, yeah, like the last two quarters. And what happened? pitch to the left, pitch to the left, and Delvin Cook ends up losing five yards on those two plays. Not both, but total. Ends up going minus five in those situations. And it's like, please, Lord. Please, Lord, something. Something, a fade of some kind. A fade. Or a, or, or just a toss to Adam uh, to Kyle Rudolph. That's, that's the only way we're going to win this game right now. Because I bet you anything... We settle for the field goal, and Drew Brees marches down the field when the Saints come marching in, and then they end up ending it. Some stupid-ass play to Taysom Hill. Ends up celebrating in the end zone, and the Saints head on to Green Bay, and the winner of this Seattle-Philly game ends up heading to San Francisco next week. But, well, right now it's 10-6 to Seattle, midway through the third quarter in Philadelphia, and, of course, Carson Wentz has uh, left the game with a, a head injury, so... Out of that guy, you know, finally his first playoff game, and what happens? He gets hurt. He gets hurt in the first quarter. I mean, <laughs> I'm not even laughing. I, I'm not meaning to laugh. I just think it's sad. That's disappointing. It's, it's, it's like a curse against Carson Wentz. The guy just cannot play in a playoff game, and now Seattle just scored a touchdown. So we're looking at a possible, yeah, 11-point lead. Mm. No. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what am I looking at? Yeah, it'll be 17-6 as long as they make their kick there. Oh, boy. Well, and they probably will. Um, but no, great play to... Why am I interrupting myself anyway? Leading up into this. But uh, you saw what happened, obviously. Adam Thielen, again, that play action. to Adam Thielen was spectacular. And it was, again, the way the offense had been, those short passes were kind of working. Those little quick screens to uh, Stefan Diggs or those slants to Stefan Diggs more like slants up the middle. They were they were working a little bit. Taylor ended up with two catches, thank God. And they were big plays that helped us get to a first down. And that was that was helpful. But then it's like, you know, the only way we're going to beat the Saints is a huge play down the field, one way or another. Adam Thielen or Stefan Diggs. Find Stefan Diggs open for that big play like we did down the stretch against like that the Dallas Cowboys or hit uh, Adam Thielen and a huge play down the field, which did happen. He did bring it in. And again, like I was saying, the pitch left, pitch left, the predictable offense took over. But then it's like there is a nookie blankie in those red zone situations, and it's Kyle Rudolph. He's that guy. He's that basketball power forward center who can always pull down the rebound in the big moments. That That's, you know, me as a quarterback, pick up football, whatever, out in some cute little field there, you know, baseball outfield, you know, just, just in the playground, you know, a little outfield. I'm usually looking for a tall guy who who has good balance and good hand-eye coordination. He's going to bring it in in those situations. And, well, that's who Kyle Rudolph is. That's what he's all about. And he's worth every penny. Every penny. I mean, you give if he makes one catch in the game, he's worth every penny because it's probably going to be a touchdown in the big moments that help you win the game. And that's what Kyle Rudolph did. Was there a push-off? I, uh, you know, it's one of those football plays where you could go either way. And thank God they did not go <laughs> to the Saints way on that one. Yes, they're going to complain. They're going to get mad, but it is what it is. Um, last year's was a lot more egregious than what happened in this one. This was, you know, 
this was nothing compared to anything that happened to the New Orleans Saints last year, so they don't have a whole lot to complain about at the end of the day. The Vikings defense was able to fluster Drew Brees and keep him in check, even though he still had pretty good numbers because, of, well, you know, the fourth quarter, he was like, what, what did he complete, like 12 passes in a row? That's going to help. Wound up with 26 of 33. That's pretty damn accurate. But again, they kept him in check, so it wasn't a blowout. They didn't take a big lead. We kept the Saints to 20 points. We kept, we kept the Saints to 20 points. That's extremely impressive in their house. So as impressive as a win as you're going to get for this Minnesota Vikings team with this quarterback, this offensive line, and such. Um, both of these teams are similar in a sense of they have a lot of weapons. It's just the quarterback position is what it is. <laughs> Drew Brees has won the Super Bowl. Drew Brees has the most touchdowns of any quarterback ever, the most yards of any quarterback ever. Going against a guy in Kirk Cousins who'd never won a playoff game. And now he wins a playoff game in New Orleans against a Hall of Fame quarterback with all these weapons. Uh, there were funny moments down the stretch when the Saints were making those big plays. What was it uh, Harris? That when Harris, after Harris made the big play from Case on Hill. And you see Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, <laughs> Teddy Bridgewater running down the field, like doing a first down or whatever it was play. He was all excited about it. And it's like, really, Teddy? He was actually running on the field. So I got a little frustrated with that, but it's like, hey, it's his team now. It's, he's not on the Vikings anymore, so I can't get mad that he's out there celebrating beating us potentially there. But uh, luckily it wasn't uh, meant to be. Uh, the Saints, again, on the other side of the Minnesota Vikings in playoff history, once again. Only that gosh darn Mickey frickin' 2009 NFC Championship game. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, you know, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, right? How has been the play for New Orleans in the playoffs? <laughs> you know what I mean? I wish, God, I wish, because obviously we were Mrs. Lincoln in 2009, you know. You know, doesn't that just drive you nuts, though? See, 87, you beat the Saints. It was just a first-round game, but we still go to the NFC title game and get heartbroken by the frickin' Redskins. 2000, many years later, 2000 season, January 2001, you roll over a pretty inferior team in the uh, divisional round in the Metrodome. Aaron Brooks leading the Saints, who beat them pretty easily. Um, oh, God. Just drives me insane. Drives me insane. Um, yeah, the playoff game many years ago as well. Uh, and then again, there's 2009, and there's, uh, well, no, yeah, yeah, there was the 87 game. 2000 game, and yep, it was 3-1, and one. so now this is game number 5. 87, 2000, 2000 frickin' 9, NFC title game, and, well, and then you had the Minneapolis Miracle, where we gave up a 17-point lead, which, of course, they made sure they let us know about the, the Saints could come back on the Vikings with a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter, and, of course, 17-point lead at the half at the end of the day in that one. You took a Minneapolis Miracle, you had a quarterback with a limited arm, you had a defense that was still really good, but again, a quarterback with a limited arm, and the fact we were supposed to win that game. We were the home team. We were the home team in that game. So that that's a massive difference when you sit down and analyze that, and that doesn't take rocket science to figure that out. This is a 13-3 and team we just beat on the road. 13-3. and That's unbelievable. And, well, I mean, it, nobody, nobody saw this one coming. Of course, optimistic fans are out there. I, I was not one of them. I was not optimistic. Okay, and if you're optimistic, good for you. Thank you for being right. Thank you very much for being right. I appreciate it. But uh, to me, this is much, much more impressive than the Minneapolis Miracle. Yeah, we didn't have to rely on a little luck, a little mistake. Well, let's call it a colossal mistake by Marcus Williams, the safety of the Saints. We relied on, well, not being totally destroyed in the second half when things were coming the other direction. We relied on hanging in there, uh, weathering the storm, and then the one little bit of luck we had was the doggone coin toss, which, of course, killed us in 2009. We never saw the ball because the Saints didn't have to score a touchdown to win that game. All they had to do was kick a field goal. That's all they had to do. See? I mean, and, of course, some pass interference plays that were questionable at best in that game. But uh, history remains on the Vikings' side in the postseason versus the New Orleans Saints. We are now 4-1. and one. Four and one. If, if that was a seven-game series, we just beat him. We just beat them in five. Not bad, eh? Not bad. So, well, <laughs> for the first time ever, that's the funny part. For the first time ever, we were the underdog. I mean, I think the Saints maybe were slight favorites. But most people, uh, back in 09, slight. A lot of people thought the Vikings were going to win that game. I thought the Vikings were going to win the game in 2009. Most people did. 
Uh, of course, play, it was split throughout the country, but it is what it is. To me, this is the most impressive Viking playoff win in eons. And pro- probably 87. I mean, probably against Joe Montana, 87, I would say. Uh, awesome. Awesome win. And now we get to play against Joe Montana's old team, a young quarterback who's, uh, you know, he's not super young anymore. He's in his mid-20s. A lot of people call him the GQ quarterback. And that's who the Vikings will play Saturday afternoon, 335 NBC. So the best picture quality, I would say, on TV today when it comes to sports. Uh, something to look forward to. Fran Turkington Award today. It's got to go to, should I give it to Daniil Hunter once again? I'm, I'm going to have Daniil Hunter and Kirk Cousins share it. Uh, and Dan Bailey was just lights out as a kicker as well. Right down the middle. You just you feel so confident in the guy, and I love him. Thank God. Uh, I just wish we could get a return once in a while on special teams and deny the other team some returns because it got kind of scary for a while. Mm, yes, it did. Uh, but no, Fran Tarkington Award going that direction. I'm not going to pass out a Fran Tarkington Award to Xavier Rhodes, even though he got torched and he was on the sidelines blaming uh, Harrison Smith a bit for not being magically there in the right place at the right time when, well, the guy, he faded off of him. So, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you fade off of him and you're just relying only on help in that situation. The ball was clearly heading towards Harris. So, I don't know what to say about that. That was extremely frustrating. It was kind of a too little, too late situation. But uh, Everson Griffin deserves a ton of credit as well. What a great playoff game for Everson Griffin. A guy who a lot of people thought was a bit past his prime and might even be in his last season with Minnesota because he's expensive and he's older. But great playoff game for him. Maybe he could be uh, like uh, Michael Strahan, lead his, help lead his team to a Super Bowl championship and then retire. Just step away. Like, yep, we won the Super Bowl and now I'm going to step away. Maybe that's what will happen. But uh, that's where the Fran Award is going. I'm not going to even pass out a Christian Ponner uh, uh, memorial today other than just, whew, don't uh, stop scaring us. Like, you know, stop with the prevent defense down the stretch. I mean, give Drew Brees credit, obviously. Sean Payton credit with those tricky plays. And, of course, continuously uh, including... Uh, <laughs> it drove me absolutely nuts. But uh, continuously... In, uh, including Taysom Hill, one player after another. Uh, he has the strength, he has the ability. 28-yard rush, uh, among many others. Latavius Murray was adequate when given the opportunity. He only rushed the ball five times, wow. But um, credit the Vikings' defense for really limiting one player after another. It was just Taysom Hill. He would have been the hero. He would have been the Drew Brees award winner <laughs> because Drew Brees is Mr. Saint. There's, nobody else is going to take that from him other than maybe Sean Payton. Mm. But uh, there it is. There's your, uh, <laughs> there, there it is. I mean, Taysom Hill, he can do a little bit of everything. Vikings should, could sure use an a, a interesting player like that on the field. What I also liked is how the Saints uh, tried to fake a field, uh, fake a punt, part of me, and then they were whistled for a false start. That also was a huge moment for the Vikings. That could have been a big problem because they would have easily had the first down. Thank God there was a false start. But, well, it is what it is. Minnesota beats New Orleans 26-20. We'll talk about the San Francisco 49ers and look all over Wild Card Weekend. It's segment number two. And we are back here on Purple Mafia, segment number two. Time to look into Wild Card Weekend and, of course, preview divisional playoffs weekend. Minnesota Vikings, San Francisco 49ers. That will, of course, be the very end of the, uh, for the second segment, like it always is. We'll look at a little history between these teams because we played in the playoffs against these guys as well. Getting to that in a little bit. But, well, yeah, that one's a little bit of a mixed bag. Of course, not a, nearly as dominant as it was against the Saints. Mixed bag of a weekend, but generally speaking, it's pretty good. Pretty good quality stuff. The only dud was probably the last one, Seattle versus Philly. Yeah, no Carson Wentz within the, after the first quarter. It's like, eh, I don't know. I'm sick of Seattle. Philadelphia without Carson Wentz. And, I mean, uh, Josh McGowan, I mean, he's, he's my age. I mean, you know, he's like 40 years old. And Tom Brady's, yeah, Tom Brady's about 40 years old. He's a little over 40. He's the oldest player in the league. Probably the only player in the league older than me, with maybe one or two exceptions that I'm blanking on. Yeah, we'll get to that. Let's just get to the point here. Buffalo and Houston, Texas, Saturday afternoon, AFC football. 
quite a classic. Was really happy to see Buffalo taking a nice lead over Houston. Just like Houston many, 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 many years ago, back in good old 92, took a 32-point lead over the Buffalo Bills. I wouldn't call this the revenge factor. I thought Buffalo was the better team. I really did, but... Josh Allen, kind of, you know, a little bit of rookie, a uh, little bit of rookie jitters in this one because this is his first playoff game, and I don't know, he wasn't as good as you'd expect, I suppose. And I mean, I don't know, you're going to be nervous, you're going to make some weird mistakes, you're going to be inaccurate here and there, you're going to lose a fumble, you're going to just make some ill-advised errors. And Deshaun Watson, as the game wore on, just got better and better and better. Kind of how the Saints got better and better and better in the third into the fourth, basically, against our Minnesota Vikings similar for Buffalo. They took a 16-point lead. I felt super good about it. I thought Buffalo's defense was awesome. The uh, Houston Texans were frustrated. This and that. Couldn't get a whole lot going on the ground. They just could not. I mean, Duke, or excuse me, Carlos Hyde, Duke Johnson. Yeah, he had a, he had a little bit of a run in there uh, down the stretch. Carlos Hyde struggled. Deshaun Watson, though, some key first downs, moving the chains for him. Uh, Devin Singletary looked like everything was going to go great, especially after one of his long runs, a 38-yarder. You felt good about it. You thought uh, maybe the uh, you thought maybe the Buffalo Bills would get rolling in the right direction, but it just ended up not happening at the end of the day. Uh, Josh Allen showing some of that mobility again. Uh, Singletary was good in every aspect. Frank Gore, you feel bad. Is, is is this it? I mean, you might see the end of three legends at the end of this weekend. You just might. Maybe Frank Gore, Drew Brees, and Tom Brady. You might have seen the end of three legends of this weekend. Quite possibly. Frank Gore, 22 yards in what might be his last game. I hope not, but as running backs go, I mean, they can't last forever. I mean, again, he's older than Adrian Peterson. He started two years before Adrian Peterson, so we're talking way back in the day. Houston would mount a comeback. Buffalo just could not hang on. They finally scored late to keep themselves ahead they're actually not ahead, but to freaking tie the game back up at the end. Steven Hushka, beautiful, cold-blooded kick. Former Seahawks kicker, cold blood running through his veins, nailed that one. I mean, Buffalo had given up a 16-point lead and given up 19 consecutive points. Good, solid run by Josh Allen to keep things alive. I was hoping, I was really hoping the Buffalo Bills would get it in the end zone, but the play just wasn't there, so they had to settle for a 47-yarder, which, again, Hushka nailed. Good for him, but then ultimately Houston... Getting the job done, Buffalo won the toss and failed to do anything, and then Houston just kind of marched down the field as they'd been doing most of the second half, unfortunately, for the Buffalo Bills. So the Buffalo Bills season comes to an end, and Houston heads to Kansas City. Kansas, yeah, to Kansas City. We'll talk about the divisional round next, but I was very much rooting for Buffalo. Uh, my friend William, former co-worker, now basically a neighbor here in Golden Valley at the moment, uh, he was rooting for Houston, apparently, but uh, no, I don't. I mean, I don't blame him. Deshaun Watson's fun to watch. Uh, William's a, a new fan of football, but he seems to love it very much. I'm glad he's enjoying it. Uh, very, very fun game. This was back and forth. Lots of fun. I just, I don't know, disappointed. I mean, Buffalo hasn't won a playoff game since 1995. And I don't like the Houston Texans. I like the Houston Oilers, damn it. Um, <laughs> but the Houston Oilers won yesterday. Yeah, they won because the Tennessee Titans won. That's why the Houston Oilers won. That's what I was explaining to my sister-in-law last night as the Vikings were uh, excuse me, the Vikings, as the Tennessee Titans were uh, running around out on the field Houston Oilers and all that uh, I don't know, and whenever the Houston Oilers, or Houston Texans play the Tennessee Titans, it's the Oiler Bowl and whenever the Browns play the uh, the uh, Baltimore Ravens, it's, it's the Brown Bowl so there's always a bowl of some sort Oh, Buffalo. I haven't won a playoff game since 95. I felt bad for them a couple of years ago when they were 9-17. and 17. It just wasn't in the cards for them. Great defense, mediocre offense. It just, again, wasn't in the cards. And to this year, I thought Buffalo was awesome. I thought Buffalo was awesome all year. But they kind of were like us, in a way, in terms of the record should have been better than 10-6. and 6. Come on. They should have been 12-4, and 11-5. and 5, At least 11-5. and 5. But it just didn't work out for Buffalo. They wind up losing a bunch of games at the end of the year, and it, uh, it drops them significantly. And they had little to no hope of winning the division, but maybe next year they might be the favorites to win the AFC East for the first time since, you know, way back in the old days. Uh, Drew Bledsoe was the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills for a while, but Patriots were generally the ones winning that division back in the early 2000s. Buffalo Bills, I don't know, love those uniforms. I like the white helmets. Uh, and they had the blue helmets during their Super Bowl days. Uh, Super Bowls that weren't, unfortunately, that were not uh, fruitful for the Buffalo Bills. None of the four. Uh, God bless the Buffalo Bills, and on they move 
into the offseason, and Houston moves on to Kansas. I believe Kansas City, pardon me, that's their first win in their playoff history. They've struggled forever. I had a inkling that Bill O'Brien was probably going to lose his job if the Houston Texans didn't win. A lot of people might have thought Mike Tice, Mike, Mike Tice, Mike Tice, really, Joey? Mike Zimmer might have lost his job today if the Vegas got ran out of the joint because of all the rumors of the uh, second round pick, uh, first round pick, whatever the trade rumors with the Dallas Cowboys is they finally let go of Jason Garrett. They've been kind of letting him twist in the wind the last week or so, and they finally said, okay, yeah, 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 no, no, we're not bringing you back, Jason. God bless you. Uh, maybe it'll be a good offensive coordinator or quarterback's coach somewhere else at some point. Again, he was a Dallas Cowboys backup quarterback to Aikman for quite a while there back in the good old 90s. But bad old 90s if the Cowboys are winning Super Bowls. That's what I didn't like about the 90s. And Buffalo got a bit stale. But when we're talking 24 years since they won a playoff game, they're not stale anymore. Buffalo's fresh, new, and exciting, and I want them to win some freaking games. Damn it. They're not the Cowboys. They're the Bills, damn it. Cowboys is a little bit different history in the AFC and all that. AFC teams, it's hard to hate AFC teams too much. I just don't, except the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, where am I going now? So I want to add a couple of items that I probably should have mentioned in the first segment. It's one of those things where it's a notebook and then there's a mental notebook. And sometimes the mental notebook, as good as my memory is, it just, because I'm talking about 19,000 other things, things get kind of left behind. So it's a denim and a rata. I didn't even mention how one of the reasons why Vikings defense was so effective today is, well, they were rotating the defensive ends and they're moving them in, inside. Uh, again, Everson Griffin, one of the big sacks he got down the stretch, he was basically playing like John Randall, like a three technique on the inside. That was a great play. And it's like, it's like, wow, it's like, wait a minute, that looks different. And it's like, oh, I get it now. Yeah, of course, they're rotating them inside and it works. And maybe it'll work against Jimmy Garoppolo next week. We'll talk about that some more in segment Number two, as we head further into it anyway. Again, very entertaining football game. Unfortunately, did not end the way I would have liked. I'd love to see Buffalo advance. I wanted both AFC East teams to win, if you can kind of guess. You can kind of guess I wanted both AFC East teams to win, but I'm very, at the same time, as much as I wanted, wanted the Patriots to win, yes, I still like the Patriots. You can get mad at me. You can hate me for it. Well, they're out, so la-di-da. They're, they're out, so you can be happy. You can uh, dance in the streets and sing in the rain or whatever you want to do. As they were, Tennessee Titans were singing in the rain. The Houston Oilers, the real Houston Oilers, defeated the New England Patriots in Foxborough, Gillette Stadium, whatever you want to call it, in a very nasty, foggy, yucky, icky, blah game. It was kind of boring. Wasn't this game boring? Uh, but it was good defense on both teams. I mean, if New England Patriots won the Super Bowl this year, it was the defense. The reason why the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl last year was the defense. Um, absolutely, 130%. You could just feel as good as New England was earlier in this season. You could feel it wasn't their year as things went forward. Like this year, see, normally in the past, th- you know, a lot of times maybe they start off real good, and then they sink, and then, but then when it gets to be December and all that, things change so dramatically. And then it's next thing you know, bada bing bada boom they're the Patriots again you know like last year when the Minnesota Vikings played the New England Patriots you saw them as like kind of a mediocre you know like yeah they'll probably I mean obviously they're going to win their division and make the playoffs and everything maybe they'll get to the division or the AFC but they're not going to win it this year it'll probably be the Chiefs or whoever probably the Chiefs basically last year and then and then you know because I still remember I could still see (laughs) <laughs> the run, Tommy, run. Tommy, Tom Brady got his thousandth yard rushing against us, and he had that little smile on the first down signal, which was fun to watch. It, it was fun. And, you know, if you're a fan of the guy, which I am, it was kind of cool. Um, it sucked losing to them. It was embarrassing. It was a terrible freaking game for the Vikings, but you knew. You knew. I mean, if you're an experienced NFL fan, you knew. The Patriots, with their record that wasn't number one in the AFC, had a chance to, to go all the way again because the momentum was starting to pick up. This year, it just was not there. There there was no magic. It was like a magic wand. You just see a little dust falling out of the end of it. You didn't see the sparkle anymore. There was just dust. And it's like, oh no, it's it's over. Like, roll, like you know, maybe even like Rookie of the Year when all of a sudden you threw the ball and it's like, what the hell? That was like a 30 mile an hour fastball, dude. What the hell? Okay. And that's kind of the vibe I felt from the Patriots heading into the playoffs this year. I still had them go into the AFC title game, believe it or not, because I thought maybe they'd turn it on a little bit, but it just never came. It just never came in this game, and Tennessee had that little act, had that little energy to them, even though uh, Mr. 
Tannehill through an interception that was fairly costly. Might not have necessarily been his fault. Just like the Drew Brees fumble today. He mentioned that uh, the wrong route was ran and that cost him dear time trying to figure out what to do. Like throw away the ball. Get a throwaway going and he ended up getting a fumble. So he was pretty ticked off. Um, we'll get back to Drew Brees here in a couple seconds. He he might be on his way out. You never know. Not out of the Saints necessarily, but out of the league. Just he might just he might just decide he's he's done. Um, Henry, unbelievable for Tennessee, 182 yards on the ground, 22 yards receiving. So do the math. Obviously over 200 yards total offense. Spectacular game for Henry. Uh, Ryan Tannehill was rendered borderline useless, but he got the job done when it mattered. And Derrick Henry was fantastic. And really, Tennessee's defense did to Tom Brady, what the Minnesota Vikings defense did to Drew Brees today, but I think even more so, because Brady couldn't do jack. Brady couldn't do jack the whole game, and it was kind of sad, because maybe this is it. Um, I He wants to play again, but <laughs> Belichick is mum about everything. I don't know, because it's kind of similar to what's going on here, with coach and quarterback and all that. It's free agent this, and year by year, and I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say at the end of the day, but uh, Tennessee, great defense. They true, truly got the job done, and they get to go to Baltimore next week, just like the Vikings have to play a number one seed next week in uh, you know San Francisco. So we'll continue to move forward here. Again, we already talked about the Minnesota Vikings game, no kidding. But now I'll get to Drew Brees real quick before I talk about Seattle and uh, Philadelphia. There's not a whole lot to say there, really, honestly. But uh, Drew Brees in the press conference seemed awful gentle, awful kind of smiley, and at the end of the game today also, he just, you know, he lo- he had the look in his face like he was at peace, kind of, like he's at peace with everything. Like, almost like, I got a Super Bowl record, I've got all the numbers I could ever imagine, you know, like any quarterback could ever dream of. And uh, we win, we lose, whatever. He kind of had that look in his eye at the end of the game, like that, like he was at peace. Not like he was like, oh God, what am I going to do? Or he was angry. He, was, he looked like he was at peace. And that tells me, I think it's a 50, I think it's over 50% that Drew Brees retires. I, I, that's just my vibe. I could be way off. He might jump right back into the fold again. Because, uh, see, that was even during the press conference when they asked him and he said, <laughs> well, you know, it's just every year, every year by year, I evaluate and make a decision about coming back uh, year by year by year. You know, like what's going to happen and how he can improve on the field. So, We'll see what happens with Drew Brees. Maybe it'll be Teddy's team next year. Um, maybe he's just at peace with it. Uh, but I could be way off. Maybe he'll play three more years. We don't know. Um, but then near the end of the press conference, they talked about the fumble. You know, the one where Daniil Hunter crept up behind him and knocked the ball away. He was saying that was a play where the wrong route was ran. And he had to kind of, you know, scramble at what to do and ultimately try to, uh, you know, ground the ball basically. Like, you know, legally ground the ball. And Daniel Hunter was able to get to it, so he was very disappointed in his teammate. He didn't mention who, but basically he was saying, hey, you know, they ran the wrong route and it left us in the wrong place. It put him in a, in a very undesirable situation and it cost the uh, the team the ball there. And that was a very crucial point in the game because if that fumble doesn't happen, the Saints probably win the game. Probably. They probably take the lead and... I don't think the Vikings offense was ready to make that influential run with the clock going against them. Because in overtime, the clock isn't against you. Just, you know, it, it's all about whatever offense is working, do it. That's all it is. You're not worrying about trying to catch up, and trying to go against the clock, this and that. You're not that worried about it unless, well, maybe the other team did score a field goal and now you've got to drive down the field and score a touchdown or at least tie it up with a field goal, that type of situation. Um, in, in overtime, it's a lot more loosey-goosey. And that was the situation where Kirk Cousins with like, you know, a minute left. Uh, I don't know. They would have had all their timeouts still, I do believe. So it wouldn't have been a huge issue. But still, I, I don't know if I would have liked Kirk Cousins in that situation. Maybe he would have proved us wrong. But in the general consensus of things, he did prove us wrong. So interesting thoughts. I had to kind of come back on some of this. Obviously, uh you know, because I was watching the, the press conferences and such after, like, replays of the press conferences after the, the recording here in the first segment. Wanted to kind of catch up on things and just, you know, deliver some more information and my thoughts on it, this and that. I, I just, I, I have a sneaky feeling Drew Brees is more than 50% going to retire. Like, he probably hasn't fully made up his mind yet, but he's leaning that way. I think he's like, I'm probably done, but we'll see. That's, that's my guess. 
Brady is, you know, obviously I love what he's brought to the, the NFL. Um, you can say what you want about this and that. Uh, it's been fun. It's been a good run. It's been a good run. He should retire at this point, but I don't think he's going to. <laughs> I don't think he's going to. I don't know who he's going to play for, though, if it's going to be New England again. They could sure use Jimmy Garoppolo about now or some other, you know, youngster like Lamar Jackson who was available to the New England Patriots. I thought they were going to take him. I really did. I thought the Patriots were going to take Lamar Jackson last year in the draft because he was floating around right there because, well, everybody passed on Lamar Jackson in that first round. and Well, Tennessee's going to get an up-close and personal look at him in Baltimore, Maryland next weekend. Let's keep moving. But uh, lots of entertaining playoff football, so this show is going to be long. It usually is. This is usually a really long one because you got wild card and division round, which is as many games as the wild card round, and when it's a lot of entertaining back and forth conversation, uh, or should I say back and forth, but entertaining weekend, back and forth games, I'm not exactly talking to somebody at this moment, but maybe in the third segment, we'll see, <laughs> but uh, interesting back and forth uh, games, it's been uh, it's been a long run for all these guys, so good luck to the Patriots, that might be it, we'll see, that could be it, and maybe it's just time, uh, obviously, it's got to be time eventually, because, well, Father Time's undefeated, as we know. Philadelphia got to host a playoff game, and the result was about what most people expected for the NFC East team in the first round. They're going to host the game, but not win it. Uh, Seattle's obviously a deadly team still, deadly offense. Their defense is it's hit and miss. It was good against us when it mattered, I guess. Uh, but Russell Wilson's going to get his nine bajillion yards. His accuracy is usually there. But Philadelphia's pass defense, the last few games, generally during the month of December, starting off from a 5-7 and seven record, which basically was like at the brink of elimination. Once you get to 8 losses, you could pretty much, it's pretty much safe to say your team's out, barring some kind of, like, you're so, the the competition sucks so bad, you still made it with a 500 record, which is garbage in the NFL. But we've seen a 7-9 and nine team in the playoffs before. That was the Seahawks, I believe. They beat the Saints. An 8-8 eight and eight Saints team back in 2011, if I remember correctly. Um... That was really funky and kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, Philadelphia, they just, there's just, there was nothing there. There was nothing there. Uh, you have a 40 year old quarterback not named Tom Brady or Drew Brees. His name is Josh McCown. Obviously, he's made some money. He's had some good moments. He wasn't that bad, but there was just not much to it. You know, there's not a whole lot of special skills there in comparison to what Carson Wentz is supposed to give you, Russell Wilson is supposed to give you. Uh, but no, Philadelphia's past defense is what I was trying to say. Had really been locked down, as awful as it was against Kirk Cousins and the Vikings earlier in the season. It was really on lockdown. It was pretty damn good, to be quite honest. Uh, going into today's game, they actually did pretty well against Seattle. I mean, 17 points. If Carson Wentz was on his game and didn't get hurt and all that, and the Eagles' offense is clicking, they probably win this game, which is kind of funny. Uh, their defense did pretty well, but unfortunately, just wasn't meant to be today. It just wasn't. Uh, Mike Sanders was very good. Uh, if the Philadelphia Eagles had a lead, they probably would have won this game, actually. Uh, DK Metcalf was f- fantastic, though. Him and, uh, again, he was hooking up with, uh, well, obviously, let's just say Russell Wilson was the one hooking up with DK Metcalf. It was an uh, an, an inspired effort. Uh, Marshawn Lunch got in the end zone. I haven't gotten to use that name in a while. He was able to get in the end zone on the goal line, but that was about it. Uh, the <laughs> That's about all it was. Just, if you need one yard, I'll give you one. If you need two yards, I'll give you one. That's pretty much what Marshawn Lynch was in this game. Uh, Travis Homer Simpson was adequate as well. He gave you about one yard as well. But Philadelphia's defense went from garbage to good. It went. It got really damn good um, in this game in the, in the past month or so. Good, good on them for making the playoffs, but out they go. Seattle's heading to Green Bay, Wisconsin. That's going to be pretty interesting. So we'll head over into <clears throat> what we'd like to call the divisional round here, if humanly possible. Got to back up, jump around. So, who's going to start off here? Who is going to start off? We'd like to switch this over, if humanly possible, into division playoffs. We get to watch everything flick around here. So, the Minnesota Vikings will be the opening game next weekend, and we'll have to come back to that last. So, we get to open up next weekend. We're the 335. Saturday afternoon game, which will be quite interesting and quite fascinating. The winner goes to the NFC title game. Man, we're one game away from the NFC title game again. Cool. So we'll open up with Baltimore, Tennessee, and then of course Sunday 
afternoon you got yeah it's gonna be a little later now a little later a couple hours later uh, Kansas City will be hosting the Houston Texans that'll be on CBS of course Minnesota Vikings will be on NBC in the afternoon and CBS will be hosting the Ravens and Titans and the final game of the weekend heading into prime time you get Aaron Rodgers and the Packers versus Russell Wilson and the Seahawks should be a pretty good game and they've had a little minor rivalry the past few years including an NFC championship game along the way. It's been quite interesting, actually. Let's get to Tennessee Baltimore and move on here very quickly. <clears throat> the Houston Oilers, yep, the Houston Oilers versus the Baltimore Ravens or the Cleveland Browns. Man, I bet Cleveland, boy, boy, I bet they, they would just die to have this matchup right now. Uh, boy, I bet they, I bet they, I bet they really wish they could have their Cleveland Browns being this good, but Lamar Jackson is an MVP candidate. He's gone from the young guy who, you know, inexperienced, but a lot of special skills, and we'll see what happens, and wow, blah, 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 to a guy who's a legitimate MVP candidate now against uh, Derrick Henry, who was the leading rusher in the league. He ended up unseating Delvin Cook, who could not stay healthy uh, at the end of the day. Uh, Brian Tannehill's time with Tennessee has been really a, a good thing. Obviously, took over for Marcus Mariota, who was pretty mediocre. Brian Tannehill, very efficient. Yeah, Derrick Henry, awesome. 16 touchdowns on the season. He's lost three fumbles, and you could go on and on and on. You got uh, Mark Ingram leading the way with the uh, Baltimore Ravens, but Lamar Jackson with 1,200 yards rushing. Oh, my God. 36 touchdown passes. Oh, my. Seven touchdowns rushing. 1,200 yards rushing. 1,200 yards rushing. He'd be one of the leading rushers in the league. 12 touchdowns rushing. Uh 31-27 in terms of passing yards, but 36 touchdown passes. Oh, my. Whew. Yeah, that's that's a league MVP if I've ever seen one. I mean, that's... Wow. I mean, that's just like, wow. I mean, because they're so dangerous. Like, he's going to throw, he's going to run, he's going to throw, he's going to run. And then, boy, um, what an unbelievable effort he's, he's given to the... Uh, Tennessee Titans. Uh, Andrews has 10 touchdowns. Did I just call them the Titans? The Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Brown. Seven touchdowns. Hurst. Blah, blah, blah. It's just been kind of spreading the wealth around with that uh, ah, that offense. It has been uh, definitely something to spread offense there in Baltimore. And John Harbaugh's done a hell of a job. He's done a hell of a job. He's able to get the Super Bowl championship out of Joe Flacco. Multiple AFC title games. Playoff wins on the road. But they're hosting, and I think Baltimore should should win this game pretty handily over the Tennessee Titans. I think Tennessee will, will they'll present a little bit, but they're not going to beat the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, New England just wasn't up for the challenge. I would be shocked if Tennessee rolled in and shut down the uh, Baltimore Ravens. Put it this way, Brian Billick said it years and years ago, way back in 2000. This was, The game was in Tennessee. Baltimore was the underdog, but had a ton of talent, obviously. Ton of talent, the best defense in the league, and all these stars. And, you know, Trent Gelfer was holding his own at the quarterback position. He said before the game, the winner of this game not only wins the NFC, but wins the Super Bowl. Or AFC, pardon me. Well, I will say the winner of this game wins the AFC for sure. Uh, The winner of this game is going to win the AFC. I think if Tennessee somehow beats Baltimore, their confidence is going to be sky high, and clearly there's something going on. They would beat the Chiefs or the Texans for sure in the AFC title game. So the winner of this game will go to the Super Bowl. I don't see the Chiefs going to the Super Bowl this year at the end of the day. So maybe they will then after me, <laughs> after I said it. Okay, so we'll move on from that one as I try not to cough to death. Thank God for the dump button, as we like to call it. <laughs> Baltimore Ravens again opening things up. Well, the Vikings are opening it up in San Francisco, but we'll come back to that. Houston Texans head to Kansas City, Missouri. Arrowhead Stadium, Houston Texans. The two teams that often choke in the playoffs. Yep, the Houston Texans will have home field advantage in the first round. Maybe they'll even get a first round bye and they don't do jack squat. Kansas City Chiefs, they'll have a home game or a first round bye and they don't do jack squat. Or last year they got to the AFC title game, but the Patriots were just a little bit more up for the challenge. There were some very close calls in that game. Uh, Edelman picking the ball up off of God knows what. It was a miracle play. There's in that, and the Chiefs, it just wasn't in the stars. I think the Chiefs go back to their second straight AFC title game. Houston's not going to beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Are you kidding me? Nice little run. Love Deshaun Watson. He's an awesome player. Uh, loved his effort. He was gutty. Very, very, very gutty. He was very clutch against those Buffalo Bills. <clears throat> he may make things interesting for a little while, but I think Pat, but Patrick Mahomes, not Pat Mahomes, but Patrick Mahomes, uh, just kind of takes charge down the stretch and leads his team to victory. He'll put up his bajillion yards and all that. There'll be a pass rush, obviously, 
Watts, uh, J.J. Watt has uh, been a threat forever. Good thing he's finally healthy, the poor guy. He's always hurt, it seems like. Watts, Watts and Watson, both with the word Watts involved, will be factors at times. But, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be moments here and there where they might think, uh, where they might make things slightly interesting, but I just do not see the Houston Texans going into Kansas City and getting the job done. DeAndre Hopkins is obviously one of those valuable wide receivers. He has his big moments, this and that. I just don't see Watson going into Kansas City and getting and beating the Chiefs right now. I think the Chiefs should be heavily favored, uh, rightfully so, this and that, and they'll get the job done on Sunday afternoon. The Chiefs should win by a uh, they should win by double-digit points, I think 10 points, 14 points. won't be a thorough blowout, but it'll be a solid, like, you You pretty much have a pretty good idea who's going to win the game by the third quarter. And that's how I stand with the Kansas City Chiefs. They will head to uh, Baltimore, Maryland for the AFC Championship game, and I'm going to stick with the uh, Baltimore Ravens winning the AFC, so that stays the same. Obviously, the Patriots are out. They will not be heading to Baltimore, because <laughs> I thought they might knock the Chiefs out. I thought they might, just because of past history. I don't trust the Chiefs in the playoffs, but against Houston, I my trust is very, very strong. And it's nothing against Patrick Mahomes. It's it's the history of Andy Reid, Andy Reid, and of the Kansas City Chiefs again. Kansas City Chiefs for years. I just they never win playoff games, except against the freaking Vikings. They won the Super Bowl way back in uh, January 1970. Again, the uh, 69 season, the curse of 69, as they called it. Green Bay and Seattle. Ooh wee! It's going to be a good one. Uh, this is again the last game of the weekend. The winner will be playing the Minnesota Vikings <clears throat> in the NFC title game, or I would certainly like to believe. I think there's a legit chance they could be there. Uh, this is tough. This is this is a pick em for me, because Seattle's dangerous. Green Bay's funny, you know, and, but their defense is beatable. So Seattle's defense is beatable. They sure held their own against uh, the Eagles, but again, the Eagles... Their offense just wasn't there today, obviously. Without their star quarterback, it seems like the poor guy's never healthy when they need him. Carson Wentz, stay freaking healthy for once. Even though I don't like the Eagles very much, I, I really don't like Seattle. I don't like Russell Wilson out there. I, I, I don't, but it is what it is. I don't know. It, it's a, You know, Lambeau is like one of those places. It used to be a uh, land of immortality. It used to be you, you go to the frozen tundra to die, to freeze to death. Not just because of the weather, but because Green Bay was tough. They could handle the cold better than you, and they were just a better team. Unbeatable at home back in the Favre days. But in the Aaron Rodgers days, it's gotten funny in Lambeau Field in the playoffs. They've lost a lot of games in the postseason. Russell Wilson's battle-tested. Aaron Rodgers is battle-tested. They've both won one Super Bowl. They've both... uh, Well, Aaron Rodgers has lost an NFC title game. He's won an NFC title game. He's had a 15-1 season, get, go up and smoke against the New York Giants in Lambeau Field. So their playoff history is all over the place uh, in, in terms of Lambeau. Uh, Aaron Rodgers and Lambeau and all that. They beat the Chicago Bears, a pretty weak divisional opponent, in the Soldier Field years ago. That's what happened. It wasn't actually a home game for the Packers. It was a home game for the uh, Chicago Bears in that situation. Ah, man. It's, this is a tough freaking game. Oh, boy. If I have to pick a winner, though, I think Green Bay's defense is going to be the difference maker more so than Aaron Rodgers, but Aaron Rodgers will be clutch when he needs to be, that type of thing. I don't think I don't think Seattle's going to come out as a winner in this one. I mean, Green Bay's 13-3 and for a reason, and we can argue two of their losses were BS because Kirk Cousins, you know, peed down his leg, for lack of better terms there. Pardon my French there. He was l- lousy in both of those. I mean, you could at least win one of them, and the Vikings and Packers would both be 12-4, and four and... God knows what would happen. Man, this wild Minnesota Wild versus Calgary game is going back and forth here. Now it's 4-3 to three wild. Cool. Damn it, go uh, go wild, damn it. As much as I like Calgary, too. But, no, Aaron Rodgers, um, I think the Packers win. I'm going to go with the Green Bay Packers. So there's a distinct possibility the Minnesota Vikings could go to Lambeau Field for the NFC title game, <clears throat> which would be kind of crazy and kind of cool. I think might be Minnesota versus Green Bay. Wouldn't that be something? It's a distinct possibility, depending on what Minnesota is uh, ready to do against Jimmy Garoppolo and co. I think the Packers are going to win this game by a very narrow margin. Low scoring, back and forth. I think, you know, Green Seattle's defense will be whatever. Rodgers isn't going to light up the uh, Seattle defense, even though they're beatable. He's not going to light them up. The running game will be solid. I just think Green Bay's a little bit better. I think they're more of a complete team. 
And I'm, you know, just being honest and being objective. I don't want the Packers to win, but I don't want Seattle to win either. I don't like either of these teams. These are probably my two least favorite teams in the NFC. You know, throw the Steelers in, and that's three teams that I really don't like, and the Cowboys and teams like that. Of course, you know, yeah. Um, I'd cheer for the Cowboys over the Packers, though. Believe me, you know it. And the Seahawks, actually, believe it or not. The Cowboys would be my third least favorite out of that group. Um... Packers are going to win. Packers are going to win. 27-24, 24-21. It's going to be a three-point gutted out, maybe an overtime type of game. Maybe one of the team walks, one of the teams walks off with a touchdown at the end. They win the coin toss and they march down the field or whatever, or something crazy happens, a pick six. Um, I don't think Rodgers is this Houdini that he used to be, but he's clutch. He'll get those big first downs. But so is uh, Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson's certainly... <clears throat> well, he's certainly younger. Russell Wilson's more likely to be the quarterback that would win the game, but the defense of Green Bay is the more likely of the two defenses to win the game. And I think a home team in the frozen tundra, if it's going to be cold, if it's going to be cold, it might be a little bit, with a tough defense like that, a defensive battle, especially if it's super cold and maybe windy, which it could be, I think Green Bay wins that. And we're going to go along the lines of 21-17, Green Bay's going to win. I'm going to get even lower scoring on this one. Green Bay wins 21-17. And we'll host the NFC title game for the uh, umpteenth time. No, not that many times, but hopefully they'll choke again to the Vikings or the 49ers. As long as the 49ers don't piss me off super bad, I'd cheer for the 49ers over Green Bay or Seattle. Unless the Niners pull off a unless it's a New Orleans Saints situation, because this may sound crazy to most of you, but there was a time, many years ago, I liked the New Orleans Saints. I loved the New Orleans Saints. Loved the New Orleans Saints. Yeah. There was the Vikings, 49ers, and Saints are my three favorite NFC title, uh, NFC teams. And then 2009 happened, and that's how I feel about the Saints ever since. Bleep the Saints, that type of thing. Um, well, with Teddy Bridgewater on their team, I like him a little bit more. Well, here we are. Minnesota versus San Francisco. Woo, doggy. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be tough. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. San Francisco, 13-3 and on the season. Jimmy Garoppolo leading the way. Jarek McKinnon not available all season with another knee injury. Oh, such a damn shame with Ja. Jarek McKinnon always kind of liked the guy. Crazy to think it's been, gosh, he hasn't played in Minnesota since... 2017. That is the darndest thing, isn't it? Isn't that the strangest thing? It's kind of sad because I really like Jarek McKinnon, but well, you know, Latavius Murray ended up filling up that role really nicely when needed, and then at the end of the day, I mean, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. And then Jarek McKinnon got a nice, sweet offer from the San Francisco 49ers, and he's not freaking earning it in terms of his, his play on the field, that's for sure. Oh my, well, here they go. Jimmy Garoppolo, number 10, like Fran Tarkington years ago. San Francisco 49ers are the best defense in the NFL against passing yards. So Kirk Cousins has his work cut off for him against this tough defense. Uh, Richard Sherman's got a big mouth. I've always hated him, especially with the Seattle Seahawks. I liked him more with San Francisco just because it's San Francisco. I still hate his guts. Uh, still a jackass. Didn't handle things well at all with Baker Mayfield. Just flat out lied. I mean, why lie? That's stupid. This is freaking stupid. Uh, San Francisco has the second best total yards per game in the entire NFL. Number two to only New England, so now they're number one, basically. Vikings are 14th because it's kind of been but don't break all season. Very interesting statistic here, though. Guess who's got the better run defense between the two teams? Vikings. That's right. That's right, even though that's been a bit bend but don't break at times. Vikings have been 13th. The San Francisco 49ers, 17th in the league. So... As long as it isn't eight men in a box and we're not too gosh darn freaking predictable, the Minnesota Vikings uh, might have uh, this might be a recipe for Delvin Cook. They're actually in the lower half in the rushing yards. Can you believe it? But their pass defense is so damn good. It is what it is. Uh, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Uh, especially when you consider this team is 13-3 and three and you think they're ahead. You think they'd give up more passing yards because the running game is non-existent. You're up by... Uh, a good number, but San Francisco really hasn't blown people out all that much. They've had their moments. Uh, they lost to Atlanta this year. They did score 48 to, against New Orleans, but they gave up 46 in that game. Uh, very clutch. Barely beat the Seattle Seahawks 26-21 in their most recent game. The Rams game, that was kind of the one that helped them win their division and wrap things up. 
34-31. It helped. The one that ultimately wrapped it up with Seattle. But a couple of clutch wins for Garoppolo and co. Down the stretch. Including a very clutch drive at the end there for San Francisco. Uh, he's ever capable. Jimmy Garoppolo is ever capable of taking his team down the field for a victory. Uh, they've had a low-scoring games. There was a match in the Super. Uh, there was a possible Super Bowl preview in Baltimore, twenty to seventeen. That's not bad. You know, to go to Baltimore and only lose by three, it's not bad because it's going to be a you know it's going to be an equal venue in the Super Bowl in Miami. So there's going to be plenty of San Francisco and Baltimore fans in that game should these two teams meet. And I, I think there's a distinct possibility that's what's going to happen. San Francisco's defense is obviously very dangerous. Uh, they're 17th in the league in passing yards. Minnesota's only 24th. Isn't that crazy? Despite Kirk Cousins' great season, he's had so many duds of games that's hurt him. Both teams are fantastic rushing the football. San Francisco has been a bit more of a committee thing where Minnesota was like this in 2017. Dalvin Cook, yes, but Alexander Madison so freaking good. And a couple of the runs he had today were just awesome. San Francisco got the fifth best <coughs> offense in the league, and I do think that Saints game helped. Fifth best offense in the league overall, almost 400 yards a game. <clears throat> Pardon me. And again, their running numbers should be high because they've been ahead in a lot of games. 13-3, and three, you know, 13-3. and three. Uh, Vikings offense right in the middle over the course of the season. Uh, where were we? Let's get to Jimmy Garoppolo and others. Let's look at the history really quick first, though, before we get further into Garoppolo and such. It's going to be interesting, but I do expect the Vikings to try their best to get Delvin Cook going like they did. I mean, today they got him going a bit early. And then later on, you just got to rely on Kirk Cousins being clutch at the end, and he sure was when it mattered most. Most recently, the Minnesota Vikings did beat Jimmy Garoppolo's 49ers, the only time Garoppolo's played against the Vikings in a game. This was in U.S. Bank Stadium, the season opener, where just a week later, Garoppolo had the ACL, or was it two weeks later, and that effed up the 49ers' promising season last year. 24-16, an ugly game. Uh, George Kittle gave us nightmares. That's a guy you definitely got to worry about. But uh, today... Anthony Barr dropped back into coverage a bit, and he was awesome. Uh, he was flat out awesome, even against Michael frickin' Thomas. I don't know how, but the Vikings kept Michael Thomas to 70 yards. That's pretty good, considering the guy had 1,700 yards in the season. That's well below average for him. Um, Capper Doink uh, beat the Vikings on a Monday night game years ago in the uh, 2015 season. That was a Monday night game uh, very early. That was the season opener, if I remember right, and got the Vikings off to a crappy start in 2015. 20-3. Vikings couldn't do crap. And again, that was Capper Doink during his last days with Severed Sicko. Uh, that's the last time the Vikings lost to the 49ers. The Vikings won three in a row before that, believe it or not. Um, we lost in 2006, a very boring 9-3 loss. Vikings had won three in a row in 2007, 2009, and 2012. That's pretty cool. Nice stuff. 2007, that was that year where um, Adrian Peterson was hurt. And then uh, a guy by the name of uh, Chester Taylor had an awesome day coming back as he got to start that game and did awesome against the San Francisco 49ers. Did a great job. Uh, close game in 2009. That was a very gutted out game where there was the miraculous play. That was uh, Mike Singletary had taken over the 49ers and their defense was starting to get much better. And clearly they were a team on the rise. They were definitely a team on the rise that season. Uh, <laughs> and then Brett Favre threw the miraculous pass to, uh, why am I forgetting the guy's name? I know the guy's name, Greg Lewis. Uh, yep, yep. Oh, I was almost like Greg, yeah, Greg, Greg, Greg Lewis uh, to win the game. Greg Lewis's first catch with the Vikings. Spectacular play. The Vikings end up winning, squeaking it out where he beat Baltimore the next week, just barely. Little did we know the Harbaugh Bowl would pop up later. Jim Harbaugh, also in 2012. Vikings end up beating the 49ers in 2012, which is pretty surprising, actually. That was the biggest win of the year. That's when my Purple Mafia show got like 15,000 listeners for that game. Highest listened, uh, as, as high as high of a listened show as I've ever had. 15,000 listeners. And that was 2012, many years ago. Uh, Timberwolves Explosion exploded that week, too. Very happy time. Uh, Christian Ponder and co., we beat the best team in the league, the 49ers, in that game. Uh, we ended up making the playoffs, but losing right away in the first round that year. Let's look at playoff history between these two teams. 1998, after the Vikings had their miracle miracle in the Meadowlands against the uh, New York Giants, a squid kick that ended up going our way. The Vikings miraculously beat the New York Giants on the road. as the first Vikings playoff win in since since the since 1987 or 88, if I remember correctly. I believe 88. The Vikings finally won a playoff game again. Uh, 
And Dennis Green's first win on his fifth freaking try. We miraculously beat a very mediocre uh, New York Giants team and advanced to play the San Francisco 49ers and got dribbed pretty bad by Steve Young and Co. 38-22. to I still remember uh, Scott Farrell. That was the guy's name. Very obnoxious radio host from wherever. I don't even remember. East Coast somewhere. I think it's Atlanta, actually. Yeah, at, at Atlanta. Um, he was saying, yeah, the Vikings won, but they're dead next weekend. And yeah, we were dead. 38-22. I don't feel that this year. Uh, that Vikings team was not ready for any type of a playoff run. Even though there were some skilled players on that team, they were not ready for a playoff run, believe me. Um, and then other playoff history. It's no, So that was a loss, of course. 1990, after the 98, uh, excuse me, 89 season, the Vikings got just destroyed by San Francisco in San Francisco, 41 to 13. Uh, these games have all been in Candlestick, of course, Candlestick Park back in 98, and then in Candlestick in the you know the 89 season, but you know January 6, 1990, 41 13, just absolute destruction. I remember Dave Reiner was upset about one of these two games where he thought the ref was completely on the other side, but of course he was. Uh, Steve, Jerry Rice, Joe Montana, Steve Young, they're going to get every call in the book, especially back in those days. 41-13, and then the year before that, the 49ers killed the Vikings in the playoffs again. Uh, before that, yeah, it was 34-9. 1988, during the regular season, uh, just before Halloween. Of course, it was New Year's Day, 89, so it was the 88th season. The Vikings got dribbled, just crushed by the 49ers as they went on their way to win their fourth and final Super Bowl of the decade, defeating the, nope, 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 pardon me, that was their third, third Super Bowl. They went on to beat the uh, Cincinnati Bengals, and that was the, uh, the the famous drive, and the whole isn't that John Candy thing, where they drove down the field and won the game in a very low-scoring Super Bowl in 88. Uh, 1980. 1987 season was the miraculous one where the Vikings went into Nolens and beat the Cajun Cannon and then went to play the legendary Joe Montana and eventually uh, Steve Young. And the Vikings defeated the 49ers. <laughs> this is uh, the second time the two teams had played in the playoffs. So this time, history's on San Francisco's side majorly. Um, but 87, it was the Saints. So maybe it's 87 again, the Saints. We beat the Saints and then beat the 49ers of Joe Montana and such. Way back in the old days, 1970, uh, the San Francisco 49ers beat the Vikings 17-14 to in Minnesota, in this case. So uh, there was one playoff game in Minnesota. Vikings were favored back in the old days, and the 49ers knocked us out. In that case, let's see, where was I? So in 1988, let's look at that one very briefly. Wade Wilson and co. Blah, blah, blah. Fun situation. Vikings just kicked ass. Chris Carter was already on the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, what the hell is this? Nope. Chris Carter was not on the Vikings. He's on the Eagles. What is this crap? I clicked on 98. Really, Joey? <laughs> I was like, he couldn't have been. It's Anthony Carter, not Chris Carter. I apologize. 36-14. The Vikings roughed up Joe Montana. Got him pulled from the game. They actually booed Joe Montana. He come. He would go on to say, "This was the actually the best version of the San Francisco 49ers, and they lost right away in their first round bye season." Wade Wilson, three hundred yards passing, and back in those days, that's freaking crazy. Two touchdowns and an INT. Joe Montana only threw for one hundred and nine yards, and uh, wow, forty-two percent completion percentage. Montana was just flustered. Steve Young put up some numbers, but it was just a little too little, too late. Darren Nelson got forty-two yards. Anthony Carter. This is all on the ground. Anthony Carter, a, a, a trick play. To him, 30 yards. Wow. Ray Wilson even rushed for 30 along the way. Steve Young rushed for 72. Because that's Steve Young and into the end zone. That guy was a something. Anthony Carter with an unbelievable game. And again, this is 1988 when you didn't see spectacular numbers like this as often as you do today. 10 catches, 227 yards, but did not get in the end zone at the end of the day. Crazy. Uh, Hassan Jones would get in with a 5-yard catch. And Carl Hilton, a 7-yard catch into the end zone. So just one catch. All they did was catch touchdowns for the Vikings. But an entertaining game, great defense, and good on the Minnesota Vikings there. Wow, fun stuff. Roger Craig was actually on the uh, 49ers back then, not on the Minnesota Vikings. He'd be on the Vikings a couple of years later in 92. <laughs> Veteran running back who could catch and do a little bit of everything. He was a very athletic player. Uh, loved what he brought at the end of the day. Roger Craig only ran for 17 yards while wow, Vikings really shut him down. There was not a whole lot 
to go on. And of course, the Niners were, you know, passing from behind there. They were, they were playing, trying to catch up from behind in Candlestick Park, but uh, entertaining battle. Overall, the overall record between these two teams dating all the way back to 1961, back in the beginning, the early days, the very first season of the Vikings. They played in uh, October 15, 1961, and the Niners beat the Vikes 38 to 24 in Metropolitan Stadium. 23, 23, and 1. So something's got to give. Whoever wins this game has the lead in the all-time series dating back to 1961. 49ers are very old. They played in the 50s. So, yeah, they were around against the Detroit Lions in the 50s in championship games and such way back in the old days. Um, and then they sucked in the 70s for the most part. And then Joe Montana took over. <laughs> yes, he did. Um, is San Francisco on their way to another Super Bowl championship? Are they going to join the Patriots and the Steelers? Maybe, but uh, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully this purple team can take care of business before the other team has to do, do it. That would be great. Baltimore, possibly, as I think they will be in the Super Bowl. Whew, boy, um, we're going to have to, again, kind of have to be creative defensively, come up with that uh, similar game plan, but obviously throw some extra wrinkles into it to frustrate Garoppolo. He's had a hell of a season, generally speaking, He's had a good number of game-winning drives, about 4,000 yards passing, which isn't the greatest thing ever these days, but it's still good. 27 touchdowns, quarterback rating of 102. The guy's just very solid. That's what he is. Garoppolo, again, he's not a future Hall of Famer yet. Maybe someday. This is the first year he even threw for double-digit touchdowns because, you know, with New England, he had those moments. Good start to the 2016 season. Awesome start. But, you know, and then his first year starting with the 49ers in 17, that's when he, uh, you know, well, that was the early beginning there. He got hurt there, and then he got hurt in 2018. So injury after injury, and he finally stayed healthy and put up a good, solid season. Uh, he got hurt, yeah, like, again, hurt in 17, hurt in 18 with the ACL. And that's what I thought. It was a third game. Um, he throws interceptions. He had 13. Um, he, threw interse- he threw an interception in U.S. Bank Stadium in that game. He threw five interceptions in 2017, uh, three last year. So in just three games, he already had three interceptions. So I mean, you hope and pray for the, uh, you hope and pray that the uh, forty nine that uh, you can force Jimmy Garoppolo into a mistake, as he had fumbles this year. Well, yeah, he's fumbled eight times and he's lost five. So I mean, I won't call him a no. Nope, he's he's lost four. Pardon me. Um, I wouldn't call him a turnover machine, but that's seventeen. Seventeen turnovers. It's more than one a game. So. That's going to help the Vikings' chances against Jimmy Garoppolo if they can get him to, you know, they can get him to turn the ball over. Obviously, he's, he's a guy who hasn't had a whole lot of game action, and this is his first playoff game. His first playoff game versus Drew Brees. He's had, you know, a bajillion playoff games, and has won the Super Bowl, and has beaten the Vikings in the playoffs before, and you could go on forever. So, it's going to be a very fascinating, uh, very fascinating game coming up this Saturday afternoon. Only six days away. It's going to be a fascinating battle. Obviously, San Francisco's been resting. The Vikings, well, obviously they played today. So, significantly less amount of rest for us. But luckily, the Vikings came out unscathed for the most part, from what we know. And we survived with two important cornerbacks missing. Looks like McKenzie Alexander will hopefully be able to play with that sore knee. And again, Mike Hughes will not play again the rest of the season. He's on injured reserve. So, that's kind of is what it is. Uh, first playoff game for uh, Mr. Jimmy Garoppolo. Hopefully the Vikings can fluster him into an 0-1 record in the postseason. Because if we do, there's a legitimate chance the Vikings could go to the Super Bowl this year, if this happens. Uh, fantastic battle. Obviously, it's a great team. Their defense is unbelievable. So, Kirk Cousins, well, it, he finally won his first playoff game. So, we're, we have no right to be cocky at this point. We just have a right to be slightly more confident now that uh, our quarterback, who often gets flustered, wasn't flustered today when it mattered most and got the job done. That was a big key. Uh, San Francisco has forced 21 fumbles on the season, which is number one in the league. <laughs> so that's something to talk about. Again, the run defense is not as good as their past defense. 21 fumbles on the season. Five touchdowns. That's tied for basically second with the Jets of all teams. Passes deflected. They're you know they're in the upper third. So basically every major defensive statistic they're way up there. Uh, Forty eight sacks on the season, tied with Minnesota. Again, not counting today's game because it was a playoff game. Oh boy. Well, interceptions not as many. Only twelve on the season. Hopefully it's zero in this uh, uh, divisional round game. Minnesota versus San Francisco. It's going to be a fascinating matchup. 
Their defense is definitely a big part of the story. Now, obviously, their offense is ever capable. Great passing yards. The rushing yards is number two in the league, which is, again, insane. But at the same time, again, rushing yards number two in the league because why? Because they were ahead in a lot of games. So, of course, they're going to run the ball a lot. They're going to rely on running the ball. That might be why Garoppolo didn't get a bajillion yards on the ground. It's a it's a committee. you got the former Atlanta Falcon, uh, Tevin Coleman, out there, 544, six touchdowns, powerful guy. Raheem Mozart, Mozart, not Mozart, but Mozart, uh, eight touchdowns on the year to lead the club. Wow. Jimmy Garoppolo actually fumbled ten times this year, but lost five officially. So now, I'm getting conflicting numbers here. It's kind of annoying. So officially he's fumbled five times. That's, again, that's a number right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a number. 18 fumbles on this, uh, 18 turnovers for Garoppolo. That's a, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Maybe you get a big fumble on him right, uh, down the stretch. Uh, Matt Bright has obviously been a factor as well. He gets a solid uh, run per carry there. Five and a half for Rasheed Mustard. Bright, a little over four. And Tevin Coleman's a solid four yards to carry. It's not great, but it's that power guy who can be a goal line threat at the end of the day. So, kind of is what it is. George Kittle's the scariest player on this team by far in terms of receiving the ball. A tight end, of course. A guy who's been banged up a little bit, but over a thousand yards from your tight end and he's your leading receiver. He's a hell of a player. And he gave us nightmares last year in the season opener. Uh, he made... Our linebackers look stupid on numerous occasions. I thought the 49ers were going to win that game the way things were going. Garoppolo hitting George Kittle for some big, big, big time plays. So, um, again, you're just going to have to have a, you know, the linebackers be focused and healthy and ready to go. Healthy enough, anyway, because nobody's going to be 100%. <laughs> Nobody is. Uh, healthy and ready to go against George Kittle in this club. Obviously, it's a tough, tough, tough matchup. Uh, it's their first playoff game in their new stadium. So, it's been a while since San Francisco's been in the playoffs. It's been quite a while. Since 2013, when they got knocked away by uh, well, their current their current uh, cornerback, old Mr. Big Mouth himself, <laughs> God Richard Sherman, one interception on the season. He's deflected 11 passes. He's 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 beatable. He's he's beatable now. He's not as unst- he's not as spectacular as he was in the Legion of Boom days, but still still very 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 rock solid though. Uh, again, he got a torn Achilles a couple of years ago with Seattle, and that was the end of his run there because it was just, unfortunately, time for them, time to move on. They couldn't afford to keep him, and San Francisco scooped him up, and they've generally been pretty happy. Uh, he's gotten beaten at times. He's gotten beaten. He's been made look silly on occasion, but generally speaking, this year, he's been pretty rock solid. He was worse last year than he was this year. San Francisco's been on a mission all season. Three interceptions officially. Uh, three interceptions officially for Richard Sherman. One of them was a pick six along the way. Akilah Witherspoon also has a pick six, and... Fred Warner, a pick six. So three pick sixes this year for uh, the San Francisco defense. Uh, again, hopefully uh, Anthony Harris can keep doing what he's doing, force Garoppolo into a turnover, or God knows who. Maybe it'll be someone else. It's going to be a very entertaining matchup. It's almost a pick em for me again. I think it's going to be very close. It's going to come down to the wire. This is not going to be a blowout, folks. This is not going to be a blowout at all. Two very good defenses against two quarterbacks that have turned the ball over on occasion. Kirk Cousins has protected the ball much better this year than he has any other year in his career. Uh, and he's proven he can win. He can win in uh, the toughest environment of all, New Orleans. Vikings never win in New Orleans, particularly in the postseason. Never, ever, ever, ever. And they did. With Kirk Cousins as the starting quarterback the entire game. It's not like he was in and out or he came in as a miracle backup or or he started and sat out, but he got, he got banged up or something. No, uh, he was out there for every snap. Uh, at the end of the day, including the final little fade to uh, Kyle Rudolph. So that's kind of, I mean, that's what we're hoping for. Kyle Rudolph's got to be that ongoing jump ball threat in the end zone. Uh, to get to the goal line, to me, that's the safest bet. Uh, again, this rush defense is spectacular, or not spectacular, this rush defense is beatable. I expect Delvin Cook to get in the century mark in this game. Alexander Madison, I mean, if it's not working with Delvin Cook, quickly move to Alexander Madison and back to Cook, back and forth, keep a rotation going there, and again, disguise defensive packages, blitz packages with this guy, Garoppolo, I think we could force him into something. He's at home, but the pressure's on him. Uh, the pressure is 100%, 100% on him. He did a hell of a job in Seattle. Give him all the credit in the world. That was basically a playoff game, so he did a hell of a job. It's it's not like it's not like he can't do it, but, oh man, I, I don't want to pick against the Vikings in this game. But at the same time, it's it's hard to it's hard to go against San Francisco either in this game because I do think they can absolutely win the game. 
Oh, boy. Should I go on a limb? Should I go out on a limb and pick the underdogs in this one? Should I pick the Minnesota Vikings? Oh, I, I think there is a very strong possibility of a playoff run for Minnesota. I mean, you, you can believe it now because of what they accomplished today. I will pick the Vikings to beat the 49ers in another nail-biter. Possibly another overtime game, which should be a little tiring, but it is what it is. I think the Vikings take an early lead. I think they hang on to it for a long period of time. I think it's a very interesting back-and-forth battle. But if you can build a lead on this team and you can run the ball successfully, maybe just maybe good things will happen at the end of the day. I got a sneaky feeling that uh, Garoppolo's going to make some mistakes. My biggest fear, again, is George Kittle. 100% Garoppolo and Kittle combination. That's a huge threat to me in this game. Uh, I'm scared to death about that matchup, actually. Uh, boy, I'm, I'm very scared. Uh, but I'm going to pick the Vikings to win the game. I can't believe I'm even doing it. But it's going to be, you know, there's going to be some points on the board. It's going to be like 27, 24, along the likes of that. Minnesota's going to squeak it out and head to the NFC title game against the Green Bay Packers. That's just my guess. After that, I don't know. I, I'm not going to pick that. I'm not going to pick that game. Let's just get there when we get there. <laughs> I just whew. Maybe it'll be Seattle. Maybe it'll be completely different. I would not be surprised if Seattle wins. I think both of these games are very much pick but I got a sneaky feeling the Vikings are going to beat San Francisco. I got a sneaky feeling, but it's going to be super close, 27-24. But uh, Delvin Cook will be a huge difference. Kyle Rudolph and pray to God that George Kittle isn't. Uh, if the linebackers are as locked in, as focused as they were today, and they don't get gassed like they were down the stretch, which did hurt us quite a bit when I was bitching and moaning about not bringing Jared Cook down. They were gassed. It is what it is. Just pray to God they don't get gassed again against San Francisco because I think then for 49ers, very pretty good chance they could win the game. But if you can stop all those weapons with uh, New Orleans, you can stop the weapons in San Francisco as well. Uh, with that said, Minnesota was 27-24 and advances to the NFC title game, which would be amazing. Uh, we'll take a quick break. And hear from you guys in segment number three, Fan Interaction. And we are back here on Purple Mafia, segment number three, Fan Interaction. We'll start off with Twitter at Purple Mafia Show. At Purple Mafia Show, got the wild game and overtime in the background, so please... Excuse me if I'm a little distracted. It's interesting stuff. Uh, Calgary tied 4-4 four to four here, of course. <laughs> want to thank Vinrock Vince Germano, Lakers Pies Browns, at Vinrock44 for retweeting the most recent show. And, uh, he is out of Australia, Melbourne, Australia. Malcolm McSween out of Southern California retweeting the most recent show. Episode 310, Wildcard Weekend Preview. So, now we get on to the divisional playoff preview and the Minnesota Vikings' uh, big win against the... Uh, New Orleans, uh, New Orleans Saints, pardon me. Tene Brown also retweeted the show most recently from uh, New Zealand. Thank you, Tene Brown, for that. Now we'll hear from Mad Martin off and on here. I don't believe he called in. I checked. Didn't see anything this time. Boy, some people are getting noisy around us. But uh, I also heard from, uh, actually, I did hear from Sebastian today. It's on the Facebook Messenger. And see if I can get the first one there, because that's kind of like what sums it all up. That would be this one, if I can get this going. I can't believe we did it. I'm sorry. I called one of my other friends first, but I can't believe we did it. In New Orleans, Kirk makes a balls-out throw, going deep to Thielen. Then Rudy doesn't only get the push-off. He gets a push-off in New Orleans. Okay, even better. Who had the blatant pass interference last year and they couldn't review it and then they wouldn't review it this game that is fantastic skull vikings let's win this game skull vikings honor your name go get the first down then get a touchdown rock them sock them fight 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 skull vikings run up the score You'll hear us yell for more. V I K I N G S. Skull Vikings, let's go. Well, there you have it. <laughs> Sebastian Barton joining the show. 
Uh, you know, it was he was both mostly just addressing me, but I figured that was cool, and I wanted to get it onto the uh, wanted to get it onto the podcast. So yeah, I mean, pretty much sums it up right there. The final couple plays of the game were just wow, unbelievable. Sebastian Barton, thank you for being a part of things there out of Mankato. Cool conversation with him, off and on with my distracted self in the afternoon. I'm sure both of us are a bit distracted. So much conversation going all over the place. Mad Martin out of Northern Scotland says, Hope this is not a rerun. At least I will not be going to bed at 4.30. Totally gutted. But I have zero expectations today, as did a lot of us, yeah. Uh, the harder RD hits Breeze, the happier I am. Now let's make a statement drive. Stupid trick play. Yep, that was that, that uh, again. Um, <clears throat> that was the uh, Stefan Diggs at quarterback crab that we did last week or so when he overthrew, uh, that was not last week but the Packer game, overthrew uh, Kirk Cousins and ended up not working out at all. This one, the ball never came out. A man I was saying, just run the ball and run the bleepers over, especially that smug bleeper on the sideline against Sean Payton. Yep. Third and four should be running down all day, run them over. The officials are struggling. The officials are struggling in New Orleans and naturally the calls are going against us. He will be really smug after that if we lose this. I really hope Breeze is so banged up they are screwed next week. Yep, I'm still bitter about 09, and I am too. Luckily, again, they won't be uh, going to Green Bay. A lot of uh, Packer fans are actually afraid that the uh, uh, about the Saints coming there. They're actually quite afraid. So who knows? They won't have to worry about that now. It's going to be Seattle though, and Seattle's been tough to deal with too. Mad Mark continues saying, run game is working, just run over their collective arses. Need to focus instead of giving it one giving it one on the sidelines, but yes, he's done. Who was that again? That was where did it go? Um yeah, I was yeah, I was talking about I hope that's this is the last game Rhodes ever plays. Well, it won't be. It won't be, and I shouldn't have said that. I was just negative thinking we're probably gonna lose and Rhodes just got schooled by that stupid play, so that deep play down the field. Oh, man. That hill was a tough son of a gun. Uh, he says, Saints magically get a five-minute breather. Cable breaks? What? Four down territory. What the doctor ordered now. They've got to convert this into seven points. Again, that was the that was the uh, the interception from Anthony Harris. Oh, watching a shootout in the wild. Failed to score again and again. And again. Oh, because... As long as the O can eat clock and put points on the board, we can dagger the bleepers. And it was heading that direction, but then it just didn't, of course. Oh, man. Yep. My Martin loved the hit from 29. Got lucky on the call. Yep, that was one where... I believe that was the fumble play. That was a scary one, without a doubt. Oh, boy. Whew, back and forth little thing there. Ah, uh, he says, starting to feel like two years ago, now we need Cousins to earn his wages and drive the wire... Uh, on this drive and wipe the smug smile off Peyton's Payton's face. D's done all it can to win this. Why are we playing so soft? Again, that was when everything got very prevent-ish like later on. Terrible dree on that final drive. Yep, yes it was. Oh, God. My Wilder not scoring on anybody. <laughs> I'm getting dressed. Sorry, I'm distracted. He said, we played good enough to win this game. Let's roll the dice. Skull. And that was into the fourth quarter and into the final and all that. That's uh, overtime. Tanae Brown is saying, don't like our chances. Offense has looked terrible since the start of the fourth. Let's hope they get the job done, though. Little faith required, says uh, Mad Martin back to Tanae Brown out of New Zealand again. Oh, boy. Calgary does not win the game there. That's a good, scary moment. Uh, Tanae Brown says, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Kirk leads the way with the big throw to Adam Thielen and finding Rudolph in the corner. Yep, the fade... A fade to the back left corner of the end zone. That was just, uh, what a beautiful feeling that was. Mad Martin says, does that not feel bleeping great? Never in doubt. <laughs> Never in doubt. Karma is a bitch, Peyton. Three heartbreaking losses on three seasons. Long, long may it continue. Oh, looks like the Wild won, I guess. Yes, I think they did. That should be. Oh, no, or is the other, if it's Calgary, one more chance. I think they do. Okay, okay, that would have been uh, Ryan Donato. Good fake there, buddy. Okay, Mad Martin says, problems is I, I know I have expectations next week. Uh-oh. So, uh, Tene responds with week by week. The more excited we get, the more it hurts if we lose. Got a lot of work to do. Those Niners are tough. Yes, I agree. They're very tough. Mad Martin says, I was the most chilled I've ever been for a playoff game. Just felt the Taints would lose again. Now we get serious. No reason why we can't beat the 49ers. T 
team has the playoff experience on like the 49ers, we are going to Green Bay for the championship. And I, I think so too for the NFC title game. I think so. Mad Martin has Obi-Wan Kenobi, an image there of him in uh, The New Hope saying, I feel a great disturbance in the force as if millions of Saints fans cried out in terror and then we were, and then were silenced. Yes, indeed. And then were silenced. Yes. Yes, they were. They were silenced, all right. Ah, oh, Wild just cannot finish. And they just could not get the freaking stop. Ah, oh, now watch Mangiapani. He does not score. Thank you, the Lord Almighty. Okay, here we go. Uh, Mad Martin says, Saints are now the first team in NFL history to have six straight playoff eliminations by one score and the one team since the Packers from 2013-15 to be eliminated in three straight postseasons on the final play of a game. Sad, eh? Karma. Yeah, it's been bad ever since 2009. They haven't won Jack Squat since 2009. Haven't won Jack. So having them in the Super Bowl on my part might have been a little mistake. Man, it's stupid. I hate shootouts like this. They We always lose ones like this that never end. Oh, well, there's Twitter. Thank you so much, Mad Martin. You're a star candidate always, and Sebastian should be too. Fun, cool guy. Let's go to Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash Purple Mafia Show. Facebook.com forward slash Purple Mafia Show and MN Vikings Haven as well, giving them a shout out because they're kind enough to allow me to post links to Purple Mafia on that page. They do a lot of the same stuff I do with in game threads and all that. So, continuing off of the last episode, Gerald String out of Nebraska says, Well, if the Vikings were going to win the Super Bowl when we least expect it, I guess this could be our year. LOL. Honestly, it would take divine intervention level of uh, in, uh, type of help for that to even remotely have a chance of happening. At the end of the day, they would still find a way to blow it. Oh, that's what I'm afraid of. I hope they don't. Oh, God. It's a shootout that's never going to end. Next thing you know, the coaches will be shooting. Oh. Yeah, it'll be the coaches next before you know it by the time this stupid thing ends. Oh, come on, Wild. Just win it. Yep, and the Gophers did win the Outback Bowl against the Auburn Tigers. Again, more damn eagle, and I do apologize <laughs> on behalf of the state of Minnesota, God bless you, Cedric Paulding, and uh, I know you're a great, uh, big time fan of the Auburn Tigers. I like the Auburn Tigers too, but this is the first time I've ever cheered against the Auburn Tigers in a game. Actually, I like Auburn. I like them a lot. I mean, everybody they play against, and yes, the Wild lost. Great, but they got a point out of it. Boo! Somebody named Dubay, Dylan Dubay, I believe is his name. Not Jeff Dubay. It's not spelled the same either. But uh, yeah, Dylan Dubay, one of those, one of those uh, lower end guys. Bull crap, but yep, the Gophers won the uh, Outback. The Gophers won the Outback Bowl. Got a very crystallized-looking trophy with the boomerang on it, and uh, pretty damn cool. The trophy's interesting-looking, but I got to tell you, the uh, Rose Bowl trophy is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That thing is a, eh, oh, oh, it's better looking than the Lombardi Trophy. It just doesn't mean quite as much as the Lombardi Trophy, though. Lombardi Trophy is the number one trophy of them all when it comes to football, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, nothing replaces. A Super Bowl championship, but winning a Rose Bowl if the Gophers get there next year would be unbelievable. And Wisconsin not winning it is a good thing, too. Congratulations, Oregon Ducks, and we'll see what happens with LSU and Clemson. I'm, I'm not a big, giant college football fan. I'm really not. But uh, when it's bowl season, what the hell? Especially if the Gophers are in a significant one, which they were again this year for the second time in a few years. Uh, we won the Quick Lane Bowl last year, which is nice, but it's one of those lower-tier ones. Uh, you have to start somewhere, and it has led to something. Mark Carlson, Iowa, says, watch some of the game today with Sidney Carlson today. And uh, indeed, it was uh, pretty damn cool, that crystalline trophy. Coming to the Minnesota Gophers, Outback Bowl Champions 2019. So now we get to the in-game thread with the now. Nope, nope. First, we're talking about McKenzie Alexander and Mike Hughes will not play. Let's see what people had to say. Dave Hickey out of Iowa says, so the roads are open for the Saints to move forward. And luckily, that wasn't the case. Mark Carlson says, bad news, Joey. Why didn't any good news? And I was like, not a whole lot. Leland Albertson says, save him for next season. Nice. Yep, he's also out of Iowa. So now we get into the in-game threads and such. Busy place. Busy, busy place. You know, this is a very long show. It's probably going to be about two hours by the time it's done. Wow. But what do you expect after a game like this? It's going to be a busy, 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 busy show. And uh, maybe next week will be two, hopefully, on the positive end of things. Maybe it won't be as long. Maybe I won't ramble on as long as I did today. But there was a lot to say today. There just was. And I suppose a lot of you would like to hear what I have to say coming into a game like this. And now the thing isn't working. Ah, it just reset everything, didn't it? Oh, that's the post-game thread. I want the in-game thread. And it's screwing around like it always does. 
Oh, is it screwing around? Well, generally there was guys, yeah, like uh, Tony Coleman and someone else. I forget. I think it was Mark Carlson. Yep, was showing how there's Saints fans flipping off the camera, like one after another. That was after the, I think that was late, yeah, late in the third quarter when the Vikings went up 19 to 10, and it's like, which ultimately was 20 to 10. It's like, screw you guys. That's so stupid. I mean, I don't know. Classy. Stay classy, Saints fans. Uh, Mark Carlson was saying, Skull, Purple Mafia fans I'm watching at home, suffering a bad cold. Sorry to hear that. Uh, I don't know that word. I, I, yeah, I don't know that word. I can't pronounce it. He said, let's get the first down, then get a touchdown. Yep, I see what yep, I see he's enjoying it there. Uh, Jesse Ball was saying, the most Vikings-like start I've ever seen, shades of 9 anyone, and that was that, that stupid fumble by Thielen, but luckily that ended up not being nearly as costly as it could have been. I was getting more and more and more frustrated with the bad blocking in the second half and all that. Now the Saints made everything look completely easy down the stretch. Oh, man. Brett McCarthy, very active again. He says, I guess this is it. Truly lost for words. I keep thinking of the 87 Vikings that went into New Orleans and kicked ass. I hope that's the case today. And, well, we won. We didn't kick ass, but we won. We kind of kicked ass in our own way. Uh, Brett McCarthy was saying, looks like the defense is wearing down and defense needs to hold. We are underdogs. No one gave us a chance to keep it up like school. Yep. Oh, boy. A very entertaining, scary couple of moments there. Uh, Mark Carlson says, I've... I have never been so happy that one of our players were down. Yep, and that was again when uh, that, uh, yes, that was uh, Delvin Cook being down rather than, like, fumble there. Yep, that was a scary, scary moment. Bradbury not giving up on his blocking this time, and that was a big-time play with, I believe, on one of Alexander Madison's runs at the end of the day. Good, uh, He's a hell of a run blocker when, when need be, as long as he doesn't get too far up the field, that type of thing, and get whistled. Um, boy, yep. So many up and down moments in this game. Ben McCarthy was saying, could this be 87 all over again? And that's when the Vikings went up 20 to 10. It felt so good. Ben McCarthy was telling Diggs to calm down. Celestar Thomas was saying, guys just want to, guys just want to do their job. Yep. Ah, uh, Brett McCarthy says, I know, oh, where to go? I know or never. Uh, it, it's now or never. Vikings need some magic. And that was the drive and they got it down the stretch. That was a beautiful play. At the end of the day, let's see if there's a few more here. <coughs> Jesse Ball was saying, woo, screw the Saints, revenge from 2009. Let's go. Jesse Ball was enjoying every moment there as the Vikings kept moving forward and taking this by McCarthy was praying as we headed into overtime. See if there's any more going on. Ah, this thing like starts over, makes you go all the way down. Come on, where are you? I, I, I loaded it. I guess that's it. Yankee. Yeah, there was a lot of Yankee on here today. He says, D stack the box. Perfect chance to throw. Well, let's hand off instead. Yep, I was getting really frustrated with a lot of those plays. Jesse Ball was saying, Vikings have some angels looking over them. Need to come out after the half and fire. Terrible play calling in the red zone. Just run straight ahead. Yeah, they kept running to the left. It was the exact same play over and over again. Pitch to the left, pitch to the left, pitch to the left. And I was just going crazy. And the special teams were frustrating a bit. If we could get improvement there and not be nearly as predictable heading into San Francisco, we might have a real chance at something. So let's get to the post-game thread. If we move forward, oh, what am I What am I seeing there? Pardon me. I saw Mark Carlson. Uh, where did it go? It's so frustrating. I hate this thing. Hit the button. Yes. So, I was saying I could not believe it. And I was praying that he would throw to Kyle Rudolph. He was the only hope, and that's literally what happened. Uh, that was the only hope I thought the Vikings would get in. Andre, Audrey Zanel says, me too. Eric Mustard responded to me with, same. I may have turned Stefanski into a curse word that last series. Uh, Elutra says, help us, Rudy. Rudy Wan Kenobi, you are our, our only hope. Yep, and I was thinking the same thing, after, especially after seeing that uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi graphic from, uh, uh, meme, excuse me, on Twitter from uh, Mad Martin earlier from Northern Scotland, the legend Mad Martin. Mark Carlson says, I'm so happy, and why not? Team played great. They're, the team played great, especially on defense. I wish we would have put the game away without overtime, but that drive in OT left no doubt that this team is deadly. Skull, Purple Mafia, and thanks, Joey, for all you do to bring conversation and honest commentary to the discussions of this team. 
We live to play another day. Wow. This feels good. Bye bye, Aints. Yep, without a doubt. Bye bye, Aints. And you get some replies here. Mark Carlson reply or was continuing the conversation basically saying, I don't know how that gift got attached to my post and I can't remove it. And it's totally fine that you get to see Diggs with his helmet, I guess. It's okay. Let's just leave it there. It is what it is. Yeah, I don't know what happened either. Uh, Dave Vicky says, well said. Well said, Mark. Joey does a hell of a job keeping us all together behind the Vikings. Wow. New England out. The Saints are out. It's coming down to anybody's game, which the playoffs are supposed to be, but usually isn't. If, if, if Brady and the uh, the Patriots... Now I'm all in with the Vikings, which I always am, but not if my AFC team is the Chiefs. <laughs> Skull Vikings Brothers. Yep, thank you very much there. The San Francisco 49ers. Oh, we're going to keep hitting buttons. Dave Hickey says, That's a dirty deed done cheap. Done dirt cheap victory by the Vikings in the bayou. Dirty deeds and they're done dirt cheap. Right? Yep, I know that song very much. from the, It's from the early 80s, believe it or not. I never thought that song was that old, but yeah, the early 80s are the best, though. Tony Coleman says, Skull. Skull Vikings. On, Skull Vikings onward to San Francisco. And yep, God bless you there. Love it. Brett McCarthy, also out of South Dakota, like Tony Coleman there, says, and what an awesome line by uh, Dave Hickey up there, also saying, I do a, thank you so much for saying I do a hell of a job, and I appreciate you so much. Unbelievable. My prayers worked way to go Vikings skull Gerald String Nebraska says well I think we may have gotten away with a slight OPI very slight <laughs> but we'll take the win I don't think anyone gave us a chance and they fought hard all day I actually like our chances in Lambeau that would be the uh, NFC title game if we get there dang I thought I seen Green Bay heading out west if they play like they play today they can compete that would be the Vikings, of course. Would be classic if we end up in Green Bay for the NFC Championship. And I got a sneaky feeling that's a strong possibility. Strong possibility. Very strong. Uh, Gerald, uh, Dave Hickey says, that's what I was hoping for is a Green Bay matchup, but you can only play who's in front of you. And that's, again, the San Francisco 49ers. Bonnie Wald says, I honestly didn't think they'd pull, they'd pull it off. Skull, and a lot of us didn't. Justin Mayer Henry, yep, called the T, says uh, Justin Mayer Henry out of Colorado, says called the TD to Rudy. I knew it was going to happen there, and good call, Justin. I had a sneaky feeling, too. I was praying that's what it was going to be somehow, some way, a jump ball, something, a fade to Rudolph or a jump ball or whatever it would be, and he pulled it in. That was awesome. Chris Porter, there he is. He says, congrats, you guys. Maybe it's your turn, and thank you, Chris. I, I hope so. I hope so. That would be beautiful. Leland Albertson says he likes that. Yep, because Kirk Cousins said it again in the locker room after the game. He said, uh, you know, uh, after he's saying, you know, after a great effort, he's like, he's like, I've got three words to say. You like that? And the players had a lot of fun with him. Roxy says, oh, my God, almost a heart attack. Tony Coleman has the pirate ship out there. Well, Viking ship, pardon me, with the Viking uh, horn saying, we that. Yep, yes, we are. Thank you very much for that. Or dat, I guess you could say. <laughs> Dave Vicky says, love this. Mind if I share? And Tony says, it's not mine. I found it myself. Share away and enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. <clears throat> 87 all over again. Skull, says Brett McCarthy, believe. And a Viking graphic there. Keegan Frank has a media of some sorts there. And Jesse Ball says, woo. Love it. Love it very much. So that'll wrap up the fan interaction segment, unless there's some kind of a call-in at the last second. I did get Sebastian's audio in there. Hopefully it sounded okay the way I did it. I just kind of played it right off the phone into the microphone. It was the best way to do it at this point, because Facebook won't let me, like, save it and move it. If it did, I would be I would do that. It's just, they complicate things unnecessarily. You used to be able to move it. No, I can't. But this microphone tends to pick up stuff pretty well, so... It is what it is, right? It is what it is. As long as you can hear it pretty well, then that's what counts. That's what counts. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So gold star, this star, that star. Oh, man, I don't know. It's always super tough. I think Dave Hickey got it last week, and he's right in the running again this week. He's going to get something. Um, Mad Martin, I think, yeah, he's way up there at the top. Tanae should be in there. He had some good comments back and forth. Brett McCarthy is just the blood of the show on Facebook. Love the guy. Uh, Mark Carlson, lots of good things to say, too. Back and forth, this and that. Very entertaining battle. 
Oh, my. Uh, Brett McCarthy, Mad Martin will bring in the gold. Um, Bronze Star. Or excuse me, Silver Star. Whew, it's so tough. It's so dang tough. Silver Star should go to Dave Hickey and whew, Tony Coleman. Jesse Ball is definitely going to at least get a bronze. Silver plated bronze star along with uh, Mark Carlson bringing it in. And uh, boy, hopefully the Vikings can continue what they've been doing. What an unbelievable run. Hopefully it is 87 all over again, but a real 87, a Twins 1987 type of run. Not a Vikings 87, but a Twins 87 run. We all hoped and prayed that the 87 Vikings would carry on from what the Twins did. Move in as an underdog and go on a miraculous run, defeating a pretty good Saints team and a championship caliber 49ers team with Joe Montana, a dynasty type of team in the playoffs. And to go to the Super Bowl, if they could only have gotten past those stinking frickin' Redskins. Well, hopefully this year, if somehow, someway, this Minnesota Vikings team can get past the 49ers again. We can get past stinking frickin' Packers or Seahawks. And the ultimate dream could be achieved. Not only getting to the Super Bowl, but winning it. Because getting there is one thing, winning it is quite another. I can't pick that right now. I can't predict it. I'm not even going to pick a Green Bay-Minnesota matchup right now. I'm too nervous to pick that. I, I can't do it. I cannot do it. Put it this way, though. If San Francisco beats the Vikings, I do believe San Francisco goes to the Super Bowl. Um, like I was saying in the AFC, the Tennessee and Baltimore matchup is the, the the winner of that game goes to the Super Bowl. I think the winner between Minnesota and San Francisco is going to the Super Bowl in the, for the 2019 season in January 2020, or should we say February 2020. I do believe that. Minnesota or San Francisco, I believe this is going to be a momentum run that will put the whichever team it is going into the Super Bowl. I think San Francisco goes to the Super Bowl if they win. I think Minnesota goes to the Super Bowl if we win. And then, ultimately, I do think Baltimore is going to be waiting. And, boy, oh, boy, hopefully we can uh, force Lamar Jackson into some major mistakes. It'll be a Purple Bowl. A team with purple is going to win the Super Bowl, and hopefully it's the right purple team this time. Uh, there has been a, a couple of purple teams winning the Super Bowl, both from Baltimore. It's time for a new purple, a purple rain to, to rain in, 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 in Miami. A purple rain in Miami. Oh my, that would be beautiful. But uh, obviously a long way to go to get there. Still got to beat San Francisco, and odds are against us. But let's ride this momentum. Let's ride this train. Let's ride that train and hope for the best. Oh boy, hope all of you had a happy New Year. Sorry, I didn't even get to that. But how can you talk about New Year's when, well, maybe it really truly is a new year, a new beginning, where maybe the sadness and depression will all finally come to an end. I hope so. Um, we've waited long enough. Sometimes things happen when you least expect them. You're picking against your own team because you don't think they're you don't think they're up to the challenge. And then they prove you wrong and prove you wrong and prove you wrong, and next thing you know, they're the nineteen eighty seven world champion Minnesota Twins. Um, I, that's something we're dying for in this town. We're, we're dying for it, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, maybe we're on on that type of a terrain, on that type of a path right now. But well, step number two is in San Francisco on Saturday afternoon, three thirty-five Central Time. We will see. We will see indeed. Talk to you next week, where hopefully we are preparing for an NFC title game once again. <laughs>